right, hello, and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker. Today I have got a uh, special treat for you. Um, I'm continuing on with my Shroud Wars. I was invited on to a sh uh, non-religious agnostic and Shroud Skeptics channel, uh, my friend Kevin non Tradicath, and he's got a great show. I've been a fan of his his show, and he's been a fan of, of my show, uh, but we've never actually been on each other's shows before. So I kind of said, hey, what's going on with that? Why, why don't we do a little exchange, cultural exchange here? And, uh, you know, I'll come on your show to speak about the Shroud, and, and uh, you can come on my show to speak about Eucharistic miracles and apostolic succession, which are uh, topics for, because he's an ex-Catholic, uh, he's kind of studied these two issues. So I'd like to get his take on that. Um, but this is going to be my uh, the part one of two of my appearing on Kevin's channel, uh, Kevin non Tradicath channel on YouTube, talking about the Shroud of Turin. And he's basically made a 14 minute video explaining why he is a Shroud skeptic. And he made that video one year ago. And uh, I, he brought me on to respond to that. And you know, tell him why obviously he's wrong as a Shroud skeptic. And uh, as you can tell, I, I thoroughly refute his points and Kevin has announced he is now pro Shroud. No, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Uh, okay, so maybe that's an exaggeration, but uh, I will say this. Uh, it was a great conversation. Um, I didn't totally convince him on everything, but uh, I'm proud to say Kevin did say he changed his mind and I took away his objection from the Darcy memorandum that the Shroud is medieval on that basis. So that's that's progress. Uh, so yeah, with that said, what I'm first going to do, let's first watch the 14 minute video in its entirety in full context. Uh, I'm sure Kevin's not going to sue me for copyright, but I, I want to, you know, no interruptions, just in full context so you get what his position is. And then we'll go straight into the uh, straight into the refutation. Hey, friends. People have been asking me about the Shroud of Turin and what my thoughts are on the Shroud and probably unsurprisingly, I think that the Shroud is a medieval work of art and in this video I want to lay out the reasons why. And we'll return to the Miracle tier list as well, so stick around for that. Let's begin. So I need to start with a disclaimer. Unlike the three Eucharistic miracles that we've looked at so far, the Shroud of Turin has a ton of information available about it. Not just information like the history, but so much science has been done. So many peer-reviewed journal articles and non-peer-reviewed journal articles have been written about the Shroud. So this video is not a summary of all of the information that's out there. It's just my opinion. For better information about what's out there, I will have links in the description below, but this video is going to be shorter and strictly my opinion. In the intro, I called the Shroud both medieval and art. Let's start with why I think that the Shroud is medieval. It's mostly the radiocarbon dating. The uncalibrated dates from the individual laboratories with a one sigma error or a 68% confidence level were as follows. The Tucson lab dated it at 646 plus or minus 31 years old. The Oxford lab dated it at 750 plus or minus 30 years old. And the Zurich lab dated it at 676 plus or minus 24 years old. The unweighted mean here was 691 plus or minus 31 years, which corresponds with a date of 1273 to 1288 AD with a 68% confidence level or 1262 to 1312 with a 95% confidence level. I'm pulling this from Nature, volume 37 from the 16th of February, 1989 with the original published results of the radiocarbon dating. Since 1989, some great work has been done, which does call into question the 95% confidence level. And so I'm fine with saying that we should multiply that error magnitude by 10, which is preposterous, but still yields a range of 691 years old, plus or minus 310 years, or a rough range of 1000 AD to 1600 AD. Still nowhere close to 2000 years old and pretty squarely in the medieval era. 
And I don't buy the patch hypothesis, and neither do a lot of people, even in the pro shroud crowd. Among those who reject the invisible patch hypothesis is the YouTuber Real Seekers, who has a ton of great info on the shroud on his channel. See the essay, The Invisible Mending of the Shroud, The Theory and the Reality, available at shroud.com and linked down below for more info on the patch hypothesis and why most people seem to reject it. And the radiocarbon dating is corroborated in the historical dating. The shroud first emerged historically in 1354. In 1389, when it went on exhibition, it was denounced as false by the local Bishop of Troyes, who declared it cunningly painted, the truth being attested by the artist who painted it. So this points to both the fact that the shroud is medieval and art. And then the most common rebuttal to that from people in the pro-shroud crowd is they'll point to the Hungarian Prey Codex and say, hey, look, the Hungarian Prey Codex predates that 1354 date, and that's got to be the Shroud of Turin in the Hungarian Prey Codex, right? I don't buy it, and I'm going to let uh, a brand new podcast that I just discovered uh, explain why. This is from The Shroud of Turin is Not Authentic. Episode 3 from the Reason to Doubt podcast. The argument is that the artist was trying to communicate that this is the Shroud of Turin, and these are very distinctive weaves, and so it, his attempt to do that was to draw this zigzag pattern, which would be reminiscent of the herringbone pattern on the Shroud. That's the argument. Let's just situate this image in its historical context, because I'm not a medieval art historian. I don't look at medieval art all the time. So let's look at some depictions of this scene in medieval art and just see yep. what we're looking at. Here's some more examples. Uh, we can see in the left image here, uh, Angel sitting on a diagonal lid with- uh, Here's just, another let's one. Let's go through a couple just here so through. we can There's see. Another one looks the same, another one. You're getting the theme. This is a very common set of images that you see in the Middle Ages. So now, yeah. okay, so now we know what medieval artwork looks like and it's pretty clear it's going on there, sarcophagus lid, whatever. Let's go back to the Prey Codex and let's see what we see there. So uh, if we pull up the Prey Codex and look at the bottom image, you see, well, that, that thing there looks kind of like a diagonal rectangle, right? And then the angel is sitting on it, and he's like pointing into the thing. Seems to me that maybe this isn't the shroud at all. Maybe what the, this is is a sarcophagus. And that's the lid on an angle, which is just like all the other representations right. that we saw. So. so why is it covered with this? Herring with this herringbone, this diagonal pattern, because it's decorated just like the other ones are decorated. That's why one of them looks one way and one of them looks the other way. So you can clearly visually distinguish which one is which, right? Yeah. Uh, I think this is even further enhanced if you zoom in a little bit and kind of focus your attention right there in the middle of the diagonal piece that we're identifying as the lid, because there's something on there that uh, I think it's worth looking at. You see that? See that thing? Thing I've outlined in red there? I don't know about you, Jared. That looks kind of like a cloth to me. And then I also need to explain why I think that the shroud is art. In short, it's because an original member of the Sterp team, literally given the title the father of modern microscopy, Dr. Walter McCrone, said that the shroud was painted. Another source that I will cite to support my claim that the shroud is indeed art is Inquest on the Shroud of Turin by Joe Nickel, published in 1987. The book in full is available for free at the Internet Archive, and Chapter 11 is called The Microanalyst and the Shroud. The scientist chosen to examine the tape samples obtained by Sterp in 1978, the microanalyst whose findings would seem quite stunning to confirm the mounting evidence that the shroud is a forgery, is Walter McCrone. Walter McCrone has been termed the best known forensics microanalyst in the world, and again, a well respected and internationally known microscopist. Even Sturps Ray Rogers, who has known him for 30 years, but who now refuses to accept his findings, concedes McCrone is the best in the world and is highly specialized in his field. McCrone set to work with his polarized light microscope, the same one he likes to point out, with which he began his career. The tapes bore surface particles and fibers from blood, scorch, image, and off-image control areas. McCrone soon observed that several of the tapes also showed significant amounts of a very fine red iron oxide, ferric oxide, Fe2O3, which he determined was identical in appearance and properties 
to the particles of hydrous and anhydrous iron oxide particles, collectively known as iron earth pigment. By September of 1980, McCrone began to suggest that the cloth was a forgery. At the meeting, McCrone also began to hint that he now knew what caused the yellowing of the image area fibers. He was more specific about other discoveries. He had detected significant amounts of artists' vermilion and rose matter, he said, as well as trace amounts of still other pigments. These, he soon began to report, were ultramarine, azurite, ore pigment, and wood charcoal, all known in the Middle Ages and suggestive of the shroud's presence at some time in an artist's studio. Let's take a look at the Shroud of Turin, the great Gothic art fraud. Because if it's real, the brain of Jesus was the size of a proto-humans. By Gregory S. Paul from 2010. This article supports my claim that the Shroud of Turin is indeed... The Shroud is 4.4 meters or 14 feet long. The total height of the Shroud figure cannot be directly measured from the front view because the feet are indistinct and their posture uncertain. But it is not possible for the figure to be significantly under six feet because the lower legs would then be overly short relative to the upper legs and to the body as a whole. Although suspiciously tall, the total height and weight of the shroud figure are not abnormal. The dimensions of the head, though, are. In the shroud, the total head to height ratio is an abnormal 8.3. This exceeds even the remarkably high 7.9 to 8.0 ratio of Abraham Lincoln. That the shroud head is too small is visually obvious when it is compared to normally proportioned humans on the same scale. The dimensions of the small and narrow head of the shroud are about nine-tenths the male norm. That might not sound like much, but because of the square cube law, modest differences in dimensions result in big changes in volume. So the capacity of the cranium was at least 30% below expectations. There are other proportional problems in the shroud image, some obvious and others subtle. Concerning the obvious, one lower arm is much shorter by about a third than the other. This remarkable gross distortion cannot be attributed to different postures or angles of the arms in the response, which brings us to more subtle yet serious defects. In the front image, the hands are used to prudishly cover the genitalia, with the elbows bowed significantly out to the side, and the shoulders spread out to the side in a normal manner. Judging from the rear image, the elbows were not in contact with the surface that the alleged corpse was resting on. This arrangement may look natural, but it is not and is an artistic illusion. In order for a person to cover their genitalia in the manner of the shroud figure, the shoulders need to hunch forward a little, and the arms strongly extend towards the crotch with the elbows tucked in. This does not match the non-hunched shoulders, and it is not possible for a corpse. Other features of the shroud figure confirm that it is not real. If the cloth were actually draped upon a 3D human face, then the facial image would be grossly distorted laterally when flattened out. This obvious defect in the initial, is the initial reason the artist rejected the authenticity of the object upon first viewing. The top of the head should also have been recorded if the cloth enclosed the head. These problems in translating a 3D head into a viewer-friendly 2D image are why the 2009 replica noted above utilized a Bos relief mask. The hair drops vertically as if the man were standing rather than falling back from the head on the front and back images as expected of a corpse. The indication of wounds in the wrist are not necessarily compatible with a crucified body because nailing the wrist risk killing the victim quickly by cutting a major artery. Risks, risk cutting being a common means of suicide. Instead, the palms were probably nailed to the T of the cross with the wrists bound to the bar by rope in order to prevent the hands from pulling out of the nail. This image Despite its remarkable attributes and the considerable skills of its clever creator, it's an obvious and seriously flawed artistic. So that's it. Those are my abridged opinions on why I think that the Shroud is a medieval work of art. I could totally be wrong. I'm open to changing my mind. And I've done a lot of reading on the Shroud, but there is so much more to be read that I just haven't read yet because I think that somebody could spend their whole life studying the Shroud and still not read all of the work that's published on the Shroud. But with that, let's go to the tier list. This will likely come as a surprise to nobody, but the Shroud of Turin is the easiest S tier that I've ever given. 
Now, granted, I, I don't necessarily give out these very often, but of the four miracles that we've looked at so far, the Shroud of Turin is by far the best among the miracles. The Eucharistic miracles have very little, if any, science at all to corroborate them, but the Shroud of Turin has decades of scientific studies. It, there's no comparison between the Shroud of Turin and any Eucharistic miracle that I've looked into. The only miracles that I can think would rival the Shroud of Turin would be things like certain Marian apparitions, maybe Fatima, maybe Lourdes. I've put those on the list and I'm going to be looking into those sometime soon, adding them to the miracle tier list. But the Shroud of Turin, easy S tier, bumping all of the Eucharistic miracles down by one tier. All right, that's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Again, these are just my opinions on this shroud. There is so much work published on this shroud that I'll encourage you to go read. But people have been asking my opinion, and so here it is. Thanks, everybody. Hello and welcome to Conversations with Catholics. Just realizing now that I'm sharing a picture of me instead of the picture of Dale. Dale, <laughs> what is up? Hey, Kevin. How's it going? Uh, it is going really well. I've been really looking forward to this conversation that you and I are about to have because you are a bit of the YouTube subject matter expert on the Shroud of Turin. Uh, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself to the audience and then I guess in particular tell us about um, how it came to be that the shroud kind of became your area of interest yeah absolutely so so my name is uh, Dale Glover not Dale our seeker but I I do host <laughs> the uh, <laughs> I do I do host the real seekers podcast so I I uh, basically, I converted to um, Christianity back in 2018, uh, May 5th, to be precise. Um, before that, I was kind of on a religious quest, right? So I was a general theist, but I didn't believe in any specific religion. And I spent about eight years um, studying the various religions and the evidences for and against those religions um, until I came to faith in Christ on 20, uh, in, on, sorry, in 2018. And at that time, I started up a podcast with an atheist friend called Skeptics and Seekers. So each week we would pick a topic and we would debate that, you know, whether it's abortion or, uh, you know, does God exist or the Shroud of Turin, wh whatever it was, we would debate that. Uh, and then from there, I branched out into Real Seekers, which is my own podcast where, again, I focus on the philosophy of religion. Uh, I'll bring on various guests and, uh, yeah, still talking about various topics, including the Shroud Wars series, which I'm known for, um, which is where I bring on the experts to kind of debate certain issues related to the Shroud of Turin and get into the details. That's awesome. Thanks, Dale. Um, if you guys are not already subscribed, which I have to imagine a decent percentage of my audience, if not all of them are already, but if you're not, um, the link should be in the description down below. If it's not, then I'll make sure it's there by the end of today's stream. Um, as well as I think there'll be some notes uh, about this, today's discussion also linked in the description down below. So after this stream is over, if you guys are watching in the future, be sure to uh, check the stream down below. But uh, today, Dale and I are going to be reviewing a video. Can you believe it's been like a year and a half or something like that since I put out that that uh, video on the Shroud? Um, it's crazy. I know. Where does time go? Um, but... Uh, I've got a video pulled up and let me go ahead and jump over to that screen. There we go. And I can make that. It's full been an entire year and you still haven't learned the error of your ways yet. Still haven't <laughs> still haven't. I know it's a problem. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go like this just to make it look a little bit uh, better. Um, and what Dale and I are going to do 
is we are going to review my video in roughly four chunks because my video kind of made four different points. Those points were, so I think that the shroud is medieval and art. I listed two reasons why I think that the shroud is medieval and not ancient, not from the first century. And then I gave two reasons why I think that the shroud is art and not, you know, something else. Um, so those are the four chunks that Dale and I are going to take a look at. And Dale also has uh, slides. So we're going to watch some of the video, pause it. We're going to talk about it. Uh, and Dale, do you want to look at the slides? Um, do you want to look at the slides like uh, chunk by chunk? Or do you want to save all the slides for the end or something like that? Let's do it chunk by chunks. Yeah. So like, you know, if you're going to play the carbon 14 dating, then I'll do the, the slides for the carbon 14 dating part. Then we'll come back to your next objection and, you know, take it part by part, I think. Perfect. I think that that'll be a great plan. Okay. Um, with that, Dale, did you have any um, final notes before we jump into things? Um, I, I guess um, since we're doing it this way, one thing I'll just announce for people who are on the Pro Shroud side, we just got an amazing new announcement from uh, Pro Shroud archaeologist, uh, Dr. Bill Meacham. And he's made a new scientific finding based on the shroud as a textile. He, they've done an iso, isotrope scientific study, and they have proven beyond all reasonable doubt, and this will be published in the peer review in an upcoming journal, but it is of Middle Eastern origin. It mm. is not from Europe. And that is clear in terms of the tech, the cloth itself. It was made in the Middle East. That's super cool. How do they know that? And I, we could save that for later if you want, but I'll be interested to like jump into the science with you. Yeah, it's it's based on the, I haven't had time to read it, but it's something to do with the isotropes. Um, and I I link to in my slides, I link okay. to the, the the website where Bill Meacham's written his article there. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and I think my audience knows this already, but my, my educational background is in chemical engineering. So I'm like fairly familiar with like a lot of the... Um, methods that would be used for things like this um so i like to get a little bit into the weeds but dale gets into the weeds even further than i do so that's why i'm excited for today's conversation um all right you want to go over uh what, are you ready to i guess i could play some of the video and then we'll take it first chunk yeah so kevin what what is your first reason why are you a shroud skeptic let's okay i think i have the time point perfectly i think i'll tell you in this exact sentence. Let's see if I got it right. right. Part with why I think that the shroud is medieval. It's mostly the radiocarbon dating. <laughs> okay, okay, there you go. Mostly the radiocarbon dating. I'll, I'll <laughs> keep playing it for a second, but I got that timestamp pretty close to being to being good. I'll let myself speak for maybe sixty seconds or so, um, and then I'll pause it and uh, and and we can kind of take the discussion from there. Okay. The uncalibrated dates from the individual laboratories with a one sigma error or a 68% confidence level were as follows. The Tucson lab dated it at 646 I'll fast a little bit plus just or minus 31 we're years We're familiar old. with this paper. The Oxford one mm -hmm. plus or minus 31 years, which corresponds with a date of 1273 to 1288 AD with a 68% confidence level or 1262 to 1312 with a 95% confidence level. I'm pulling this from Nature, volume 37, from the 16th of February, 1989, with the original published results of the radiocarbon dating. Since 1989, some great work has been done, which does call into question the 95% confidence level. And so I'm fine with saying that we should multiply that error magnitude by 10, which is preposterous, but still yields a range of 691 years old, plus or minus 310 years, or a rough range of 1000 AD to 1600 AD. Still nowhere close to 2000 years old and pretty squarely in the medieval era. And I okay. I think I'm happy with um, playing that much. And so just to summarize my argument in the video, and I guess my argument up until now, but we'll see if it's still there in five minutes, is um, even if that original carbon dating is off by a factor of 10. So we take the error magnitude and we multiply that by a factor of 10. So the 95% confidence error magnitude was just 31 years in either direction. Let's make it 310 years in either direction. And we're still yep. nowhere close to being in the first century. Um, that was my point. I still think that's a good argument, but 
let's let's see uh, what what Dale thinks. So Dale, I'm happy to jump over to the slides if you think that makes the most sense. Um, but sure. you you tell me. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, so so in, yeah. In the first place, uh, while you bring up the slides, there I'll I'll just say great. So I, I think in the video you say you're you're willing to grant even though it's it is scientifically ridiculous just to help out the pro shroud side. You're willing to say, look, at, at best, if I multiply these error things by, by you know, a factor of ten, it'll still be dating between a thousand to sixteen hundred AD. Um, so that's medieval, right, for your purposes. Um, so okay, is that uh, so that so you're you're willing to grant that uh, again? That isn't how carbon fourteen dating works in reality, but you are being extra generous to the pro shroud side and you're saying it's still not good enough you're still nowhere near the first century so obviously on the the pro shroud side um we we need to come up with very so here's uh here's that uh sorry i didn't mean to jump ahead on you (laughs) no no problem i if you so if you go here's the link to that new uh uh isotrope isotope uh study that proves the shroud is of middle middle eastern origin there um so yeah, just I gave a quick little visual there in the link for people. I want to read that real quick. So Okay. I don't understand what the uh the chart is showing. Do you mind if I just like follow that link real quick and see what happens? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's read through this together a little bit. The linen of the shroud is Middle Eastern. New isotope tests prove it. I don't know what that word means, but <laughs> which one? Bill Meacham? That's oh, is that his name. last name? Oh, Meacham. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I don't I don't speak English fluently, I don't think. Um, okay. So let's see. And you know, I don't think the audience will be able to read that at all. So let me like zoom in. That probably looks significantly better for the audience. Um okay. Let's see. Recent testing on several threads provided a strong indication that the flax used to make the linen was grown in the Middle East, specifically the Western Levant. Now with a probable, okay, uh, tell me, tell me why. The isotope results are not proof of origin. Okay, let's see. Stop me if you, like, know a good part to jump to. Uh, so, like I said, I haven't I haven't had time to to read it oh, myself. That's, yet. that's fine. I just became aware of it, so I snuck it in there just for people. Hey, let me just kind of scroll through this real quick. If I see a like a graph that I'm like, oh, I know exactly what that's talking about. Um, I'll pause. Um, but if if I don't understand this, like with a quick face reading, I won't make everybody watch me sit here and digest this. I'll be able to digest it after, and we'll do a follow up <laughs> stream next time where we can talk about it. Um, but sounds good. Yeah, yeah t- this is- I'm I'm happy to kind of just jump back to the slides, um, and we can revisit this. Um, okay. But cool, yeah. I I, mm-hmm. I guess it sounds like there's some kind of um distribution for different different um areas and stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess I don't know w- why that's the case. Like that's that seem that's interesting to me that like we would expect like chemical composition to be different based on your geography um i wonder if it has to do with climate or something like that um well, yeah i mean i mean like scientists uh, if you watch documentaries scientists do this all the time for example based on based on diet and stuff and studying teeth we we can tell okay is this person from the middle east or are they northern europe or and stuff like that and so oh, there are ways cool. to yeah okay, determine cool. the regions and stuff all right cool so um, okay, so um, I just realized this is gonna, okay. So Kevin makes two positive shroud skeptical claims. Okay, one that the shroud is medieval, the other is that the shroud is an artwork. Uh, he gives two reasons as to why he thinks it's medieval one, the 1988 carbon 14 dating, and secondly, uh, the Darcy memo. We haven't gotten to that, so let's look at the 1988 carbon dating. And if you want to switch slides. Um, okay, so this this is uh, I really really small uh, when oh. you're doing the sharing, so I, I can't actually read. Um, if you just uh, hover over the the whole like hover over my camera and hit the pin button, that should make it nice and big for you. It should. Oh, Did pin. that make a difference? 
Um, a little bit. Made it a little bigger. Uh, you know what I can do is I can just go like this, and it's not going to change for the audience, but it will change for you. How does that look? Yeah. Okay, that's better. There. Cool. So, cool. Okay, so so with the 1988 carbon 1488, I, I just want to make it clear. Remember, the burden of proof is on the skeptic on this front. You're you're making a claim to know that the shroud is in fact medieval. How do you know? Because we got these carbon 14 dating results, and I think all experts agree that the raw data, what you showed in that nature paper, at least at face value, definitely supports a medieval provenance for the shroud. There, there is no way based on ordinary contamination factors or something like that alone to uh, get that shroud's provenance all the way back to the first century. It, it is scientifically impossible. So given the raw data, we have to admit, yeah, it, it is medieval, clearly. Um, now, obviously, the results reported in the 1989 Nature Journal paper um, were samples from the corner of the shroud, and it got this date between 1260 to 1390 with that 95% degree of confidence level. But this is where the pro shroud side comes in, because there have been different explanations that do provide a way for, for those carbon-14 results to be what they were in the medieval period, and yet for the the cloth's actual calendar age to be first century. And you bring one of these up in the video, which is the invisible reweave hypothesis by my friend Joe Marino. He was the one who first thought of this. Uh, but since then, several scientists, uh, even skeptics like Ray Rogers, when he first heard about this, he said, that the this is just total bunk. It's nonsense. Give me five minutes and I'll falsify it. He looked into it. And he totally changed his mind. He said, guess what? I think the invisible reweave hypothesis is true. Um, now, basically what that hypothesis says, it is just basically saying, look, it, in the 1500s, uh, there was a uh, technique called French invisible reweaving. And supposedly they reweaved a new patch into the, the shroud original cloth from 30 AD, presumably. And because of this, because there was a combination of new material from the 1500s or 1532, and then there was partial old material from 30 AD, when that averages out when you're doing the carbon dating, it arrives at a medieval date. So that's that's what the hypothesis says. Um, now, like I said, Kevin is a skeptic of this. And as he mentions in the video, I myself, I don't believe the invisible reweave hypothesis is true. But, and I, okay. I didn't let it play long enough, but if I had let it play for like another 10 seconds, I, di I do actually say, and everybody, if you know Dale from uh, from Real Seekers, Dale doesn't accept this one either. So I, I should have let it play for another 10 seconds. I'm sorry that I didn't, but but yes. Oh no worries. Yeah, but, but uh, this is still one of the viable live hypotheses out there that does have a lot of... Um, a lot of scientists and pro shroud experts uh, that still advocate for it. So it is something that you have to reckon with. Uh, however, the only thing I, I want to add is, um, look, the invisible reweave hypothesis is not the only game in town. There are other explanations that I would argue are empirically equivalent, if not empirically superior to the invisible reweave hypothesis that can equally explain the carbon-14 data giving a medieval result while the shroud's actual calendar age is from 30 AD. And that's what I go for, Bob Rucker's neutron absorption hypothesis. So um, if you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll just provide some of the factors with the invisible reweave hypothesis. What are some of the pros and the cons? So there has been scientific uh, evidence that is suggestive that maybe the invisible reweave is true. So for example, they found interwoven in the, the shroud sample where they uh, dated it, there is cotton, and this is embedded in the cloth itself. It's not later contamination or something like that, and that is unique to this area. It's not found on the rest of the shroud. Um, also, Dr. Al Adler, one of the STIRP uh, scientists, or he came on board STIRP after the, the study, and he found certain metallic salts uh, in this sample location, which is not indicative of the rest of the cloth. Um, several scholars have found various uh, remnant yellow matter dye, or Ray Rogers said he found matter rose dye in this area, which has kind of suggested that, well, if, if they patched in the new material, they, they tried to make it look painted so that it looked old and stuff like that. 
Uh, there have been wax and starch contaminations found in this carbon-14 sample location. There's also something called the blue quad mosaic image, and I, I should have uh, included a, a picture for you guys. But basically, this, this machine uh, analyzes the chemical composition of the cloth, and it is colored blue in the sample location where they dated the, dated the cloth, whereas the surrounding cloth is, is orange. It's a totally different color, suggesting a different chemical signature of some sort. So this is provided as evidence for the invisible reweave. Uh, and then finally, there have been findings of gum Arabic. So, so these are some of the scientific reasons why someone would believe in the invisible reweave. On the other side, there is evidence against it. And I think that the evidence against it is more powerful, right? So number one, look, I don't care how good the medieval uh, Renaissance reweavers are. Um, every textile expert, including Dr. Methchild Fleury Lemberg, who uh, Kevin mentions in his video, you're going to be able to see the reweave, at least on the back of the cloth. The, the shroud is a thin cloth. So you're going to see that with a compound microscope. And unfortunately, the STIRP scientists didn't see that. And neither did the t uh, textile experts when they did the 2002 restoration project. And that's why those textile experts um, disagree with it and that sort of thing. Another major objection is Bob Rucker has actually calculated out mathematically how much would have to be new material. It would have to be at least 80% new material and 20% old material from the time of Jesus in order to get those medieval results. And if it, if there, if there was a patch that was 80% brand new material, this, this would be readily apparent. Uh, it's not right. So th this is a, an issue. And obviously that's why, you know, it was on the pro shroud side, they'll point to, well, but the, the yellow matter die, that's why we, we can't see it, stuff like that. So that's where the debate is there. Um, in 2010, textile studies on the carbon-14 sample in Arizona showed that there was no evidence of major coatings or dyes. Um, there was only minor contamination signs. Um, now, here's the, uh, the kicker for me personally. Number five, the continuous horizontal striations in the threads from the main cloth through the sample location. So they, they backlit the cloth, and they showed that the, there are these continuous horizontal striations straight through the, the main cloth and continuously going into the sa carbon-14 sample location as well, suggesting it's it's not new material, it's all the same thing. And um, it's on this reason that the leader of the STIRP scientist, Dr. John Jackson, actually said it would be impossible for the invisible reweave hypothesis to be true. Um, sixth and finally, um, I also think it lacks, uh, the invisible reweave hypothesis lacks explanatory scope. Um, so as we're going to see with the carbon dating on my the following slides, look, it, it's not enough to just explain the raw dates. There are other scientifically proven data points that emerged from the carbon-14 data, such as the slope or the gradient of the results got obtained, that I think the invisible reweave doesn't attempt to explain or doesn't explain well. Uh, secondly, if the Sudarium of Oviedo is linked to the shroud, well, they carbon dated that, and that obtained a date of 700 AD. Um, that just can't be explained by the invisible reweave hypothesis. You'd have to come up with a separate answer as to, well, how did that get screwed up? If, if these two cloths covered Jesus in 30 AD, uh, why are they getting disparate carbon-14 results? Uh, so that's, in a nutshell, my assessment of the invisible reweave. Um, if you, uh, yeah, any... Yeah, we can. That's just the quote from John Jackson. So he's Jackson says we must conclude unambiguously that there has been no reweave whatsoever surrounding the radiocarbon site. That's on the basis of those horizontal striations. Uh, and ja so Jackson is a pro shroud. He's on the pro shroud team. He was the leader of STIRP. He was the head physicist that created okay. STIRP in 1978. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, go to the. Okay, so so go back up. Uh, any, any questions on the invisible reweave part? If you go back to the the thing, I think the only way for oh no, I can go like this. Go go here. So I guess the only yeah. thing is um, sometimes I like to think like um, if, if I was trying to steel man the case for the invisible reweave, um, with respect to the um to the uh, 
uh, Oviedo, the what, what's the what's the name of it again? The uh, the Sudarium of Oviedo. Sudarium, yeah. thank you. Um, I guess somebody could argue that there was two separate invisible reweaves, one one in the eighth century or whatever, and then one in the sixteenth century. Um, the eighth mm-hmm. century one being on the Sudarium, right? Like I, right? Like I guess it's. I suppose. I suppose so. Again, you would have to because. The Sudarium came up with a 700 AD date. Yeah, you would have to suppose it happened. Yeah, like when did that happen and stuff like that. And yeah, is there any evidence and stuff? So Right. You know, you're really straining credulity now. But I guess it's worth pointing out only because um, I like to live by the idea that like if you're so committed to one like it like it's almost impossible not to believe something if you've really set your heart on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so if yeah. your heart is really set on the invisible reweave you can just postulate a second invisible reweave and then you can hold on to your invisible reweave. Now, I, I think that that makes it harder to hold on to it, but not impossible. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Cool. And I'll, I'll let the audience um, ask any questions too. I don't see any questions yet. Um, just some dad jokes. I would, I would carbon date, <laughs> but I don't know any girls named carbon. <laughs> I thought that was funny. <laughs> um, okay. Carbons I think. Are tr- they are. They are. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Cool. So, I, so I'll move on then. So, so I kind of hinted then, like, okay, great. If if the invisible reweave hypothesis is not the answer, and and I'll, I'll include sources. I mean, my friend Joe Marino, he's written an eight hundred page book on the invisible reweave. So, you know, look at the the pro invisible reweave sources and decide for yourself. Don't you know? Just believe my word for it. But, um. In terms of moving on beyond that, there are other options, such as the neutron absorption hypothesis. And on that front, it's important that we understand what is all of the relevant data pertaining to the carbon-14 that needs to be explained. It's it's not just what you said, Kevin, about the raw dates, right? The average dates, oh, it, it dates from 1260 to 1390, or because you're so generous, you're, you're willing to say it's 1000 to 1600 AD. Um, that's That's one data point. But we also have the fact, uh, number one, that there's also the data point that the control samples, although they weren't blind tests, they were dated and they all came out with the proper date that was was known. So this says that whatever is affecting the carbon dating would have to be uh, relevant to the Shroud of Turin specifically. Um, We also have the distribution of the 12 subsamples. Um, and there is some question, is it 12 or 16? Because when uh, Tristan Casabianca sued the British Museum under the Freedom of Information Act, they discovered that the scientists back in 1988 fudged the data. And so they kind of, they had 16 raw value subsample dates. And they, in the paper, they only published 12. So it looks like they're excluding the outliers from the calculation. And that's, that's why they were they were totally off. They, and why would they do that? That was the only way they could get that 95% degree of confidence using the chi-square test. So, um, now, Rucker has actually looked into this, and he says that it's actually, there isn't an issue here. Basically, they, they were just averaging um, these, you know, turning eight or eight dates into four or something like that by through averaging. And that sort of thing. So, okay, so fine, that's not an objection anymore. But you still have to explain there is this distribution of 12 separate subsample dates, right? And they're not all the same dates. So you have to explain that. You also have to explain, most importantly, the slope or the gradient of the change of these 12 subsamples. So, basically, what they found scientifically as of 2017 is that there is um, a slope of these 12 subsamples. So that starting from the edge of the cloth, moving inward towards the center of the cloth, um, as you're dating this carbon uh, sample, it it cha- the dates go up by 36 years for every single centimeter. Okay, this is not just ordinary contamination. Some form of systematic bias. There is a 98.6% proven according to Bob Rucker's uh, MCNP calculations, that there's a systematic bias at play in the results that they got. And it's causing this massive jump of 36, a change of date of 36 years for every single centimeter 
you move from the outer edge of the cloth, moving in towards the center of the cloth. You have to explain that. How did that happen? Um, and yeah, well, go ahead. Yeah, so I remember um, you wound up having a conversation with the guys from Reason to Doubt, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this, Jordan. yeah, Jordan, thank you. Um, and I remember you guys talking about this. Let me ask a question and then get, if I'm misremembering, just tell me. Um, sure. And so I seem to remember something along the lines of, um, hey, if we take a look at, and I'll use a an example from the past few months. If you take a look at the past, like, what, six months of the stock market or whatever, you would assume that the stock market is going to go up by 25% like every six months or whatever because the stock market's been on a tear. But it doesn't work like that. The stock market goes up on average like 8% per year, um, mm -hmm. not 25% in six months. So I think that if, if I recall correctly, I think Jordan's point was what we are talking about here are a couple strands from the shroud. So seeing a trend that goes, you know, up and to the right like that isn't necessarily indicative. Like, like it would be shocking if we continue to test the entire length of the shroud and that trend did continue. It would be far less shocking if we actually found out that we only measured from here to here. And hold on. If we only measured from, you know, here to here, but then if you keep going past past this point, you keep going – if that trend, that trend would likely reverse kind of like the stock market. It's, you know, 8% per year on average, even though there's outlier periods like the past six months. Um, was that more or less what the conversation was? And I don't remember your response to that, frankly. Um, okay. So I'll be honest. I, I don't remember him bringing up the stock market analogy at no, all. No, that there, one was but... mine. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. No problem. I, I was worried. Am I getting older? Am I losing my memory? But uh, <laughs> I, I would just say, I, I don't think, so it is true. We, we only tested a very small portion of the cloth and it would be ex remarkable. It would in fact be, it's a prediction of Bob Rucker's neutron radiation hypothesis that if we were to carbon date other portions of the shroud, we would get, we would continue to see this, this trend, right? It, it consistent with his MCMP. So we would get younger and younger dates as we got towards the center. And that would be shocking. That would be suggestive. My gosh, this thing was neutron irradiated. That's that's a supernatural miracle. How, how the heck does a cloth get irradiated um, in the form of a body or something like that with neutrons affecting the carbon dating? So that would be shocking. However, I, I would say that it's wrong to say, well, because we were only, it's still shocking. Or to put it this way, even Jordan would agree that it is statistically significant even with just the portion finding the slope that we found um this requires some kind of explanation now he d has one right he he thinks that the reason why the oxford labs are, are so not even within the range of uh the the first lab and stuff like that um he'll say well there must be some kind of explanation for this maybe the oxford labs didn't clean the sample properly Let, let's just assume that's a natural explanation right um or we can assume or we can assume like bob rucker maybe it's also explained by the fact that there is neutron irradiation which uh irradiated the shroud cloth in different portions differently creating different carbon 14 dates along this trend kind of thing right so these are both empirically equivalent explanations up to these first four facts but then I've got facts five to seven, which or which Jordan can't and doesn't explain. And so there's also this fifth finding, which is very suggestive that Bob Rucker is true. So this comes from peer-reviewed journals like Applied Optics by Dr. Thomas McAvoy. And he's he's done independent studies of, based on the ultraviolet fluorescence intensity on the shroud images taken from SERP in 1978. And guess what? He's actually found that um, there is a, an exact correlation between the ultraviolet fluorescence curve, intensity curves, and Bob Rucker's MCNP, neutron irradiation curves. And th this is independent confirmation. Um, if you want to actually 
Uh, and uh, he, they didn't know that there would be this correlation. They only found out afterwards. They tested it. Does can, does neutron irradiation affect ultraviolet fluorescence? And they proved scientifically that it did. But no one had a clue that there was this correlation before. So if, if you just want to like maybe go down a couple slides, I just want to, I'm going to come back to this. Here it is. Perfect. Okay. So here on the left, you have, this is Bob Rucker's calculations, totally independent based on the Monte Carlo neutron particle computer software, based on the, the carbon dating that you would get. Look at this, how it matches the ultraviolet fluorescence intensity taken from the shroud images use, using spectral instruments. There is a significant correlation there. Uh, so this provides conf confirming evidence, I would say. You would have to... If you're going to explain the carbon dating, you have to explain this correlation too. The only hypothesis that does so is the supernatural neutron irradiation hypothesis of Bob Rucker. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I, I guess I'm just not sure why it is safe to assume that the neutrons would be emitted homogeneously and uniformly in all directions. Um, like it would, it would, I would imagine that we would see far more radiation towards the center of mass of the body and then far less as we get further out on the limbs just because of the mass of neutrons that would be present right like there are more neutrons in your chest than there are in your finger because there's more mass in your chest than there is in your finger right so believe it or not bob rucker has actually done subsequent um subsequent calculations and he doesn't take the this as uh, an assumption the curve still presents the same same type thing. It doesn't make a radical difference. Hmm. Uh, so he, yeah, he, he's done calculations with and without these assumptions and stuff. But yeah, uh, so if you want to cool. go back, go back up. I've got go two back more. To over here. This one, yeah, cool. perfect. So two more things. There's also a study, peer-reviewed journal uh, by Dr. by Julio Fonte. And this is also confirmatory of the neutron irradiation hypothesis. Basically, the blood stains have been proven to have a, 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 from a natural perspective, impossible lack of nitrogen levels in it. And okay, what 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 would explain this? Well, they've done work and they've proven that once again, neutron irradiation could, would explain if this is the explanation. That would explain why there are these remarkably low levels of nitrogen in the blood stains. And I'll show you the one of the graphs. I, again, I'll link to the papers in my blog. So we'll take a look at that. Um, just before we go to that, the seventh feature is the carbon dating for the sudarium of Oviedo, that head cloth, right? Now, this assumes that there is a forensic link. And I, I think I can make the argument that there that these two cloths covered the same corpse based on the blood stains and body fluids and anatomical proportions. If that assumption is true, if that's true, then we have to explain why did the sudarium carbon date at 700 AD? And guess what? Bob Rucker's neutron irradiation hypothesis perfectly fits and can explain how we would have gotten a 700 AD date if it was, if it was irradiated by neutrons being placed, as the gospels say, to the side of the body uh, after they wrap Jesus in the shroud cloth itself. Um, but yeah, if you, if you go down two slides, I'll show you the, the lack of nitrogen. I have a the... question for you about the lack of nitrogen. Is this the right slide? Let's see. I think so. Yeah. Okay, cool. I've got a question for you about that, but I'm going to let you uh, present because you, you might answer my question. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that's it. Go, go down one more slide. I think I've covered mm -hmm. everything on the carbon. Yeah, so so go back up. I, so that that's my case on the carbon dating is I think if you're going to come up with a hypothesis, you have to explain all seven or if you're iffy on the sidereum, at least the six uh, scientific data points that are relevant directly to the carbon-14 dating. So far, the only hypothesis on the table is the supernatural Bob Rucker neutron irradiation hypothesis. Um, and yeah, so that... It is the best hypothesis, but even even if you um, don't think that it's it's proven true on a balance of probabilities, 
it's it, at the very least you have to admit it's empirically equivalent and since the skeptic has the burden of proof you have to suspend judgment maybe the shrouds medieval maybe maybe it's first century but was irradiated with neutrons we don't know uh over to you gavin cool real quick before i uh i ask my question i have a very sad and important announcement to make i have head lice pass it on <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Veritas, for the super chat. <laughs> and 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 he thinks that my guest is awesome, and I, I have to agree. Um, I love that. Thank you, Veritas. I have a question for my awesome guest. Um, and if you don't know the answer, that's totally cool, and I can just kind of like dig into this paper later if I want. But um, why would we expect um, like funky stuff going on with neutrons to impact nitrogen more so than, for instance carbon or hydrogen, both of which would be more present in blood than nitrogen. Um, so I can pull up like a picture of the hemoglobin molecule. And if we, it, oops, sorry, that's not right. If we just look at like what a hemoglobin molecule looks like, it's, it'll be mostly carbon and, um, uh, and, and hydrogen um, because it's organic and everything is like that. Um, so I guess, do you know why, um, do you know why nitrogen specifically being absent is a, is like an indicator of something funky going on with neutrons um so so in order so they've scientifically established so the reason why did they get nitrogen why are they highlighting nitrogen that was a random accident it was again it was a discovery they weren't expecting to find but they found it and when they discovered that they're hmm, what could explain that then they did the test scientific testing to prove that Look, it, a possible and equally probable explanation is, well, if it was neutron irradiated, it would have this effect of giving these surprisingly low levels of nitrogen in the blood. Now, they, they also mention, and I don't know if it's the molecules you were asking about in terms of hydrogen and what else, but they, they mentioned two other things that they said with further testing, not if the neutron irradiation would also affect these, and that would provide you know, they're making a prediction, basically. If, if it's yeah. neutron irradiated, we would also see lower levels of these chemicals. And I think in the paper they said, well, we're, we're waiting for further testing to, to do that or something. Yeah. Um, and just so that everybody in the audience knows how to read these kind of like little, uh, they're the Lewis structure over here on the left, um, every single little point that doesn't have a, like a, a label is a carbon and hydrogens are implied. So when you're reading this, don't go, okay, look, I see four nitrogens here, and then I see one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's only six carbons and there's four nitrogens. No, it's actually like every, so there's a there's a carbon here, but then there's also a carbon here at the end of that double bond. And then at the single bond, there's another carbon. And then this right here would be four carbons in a, uh, in a row with a nitrogen there. So there's that one nitrogen. So th there's implied carbons. And then also what they don't show you are the implied hydrogens too. Although, yeah, so you can see that um, on the bottom, like over, no, I can't do that, but you see where my mouse is over here, there's going to be implied mm -hmm. hydrogens because if you notice, like for instance, this carbon right here has a single bond to this carbon over here and this carbon over here. And we all know about carbons, right? They want to have a full valence shell, just like every single other atom. They require um, a grand total of eight electrons to be filled in their outer valence shell. And if you look at here, they actually only have two, right? They would be borrowing one from that carbon and one from that carbon. So then they'd need two more. So where do those two electrons get borrowed from to complete its outer valence shell? Implied hydrogens. So there are implied hydrogens off to the side here. So your average hemoglobin actually has tons more hydrogen and carbon than it does nitrogen and iron and oxygen. Um, but so I guess, yeah, all of that to say, I guess I'm not sure why something would affect nitrogen specifically in like hemoglobin, like in blood. Um, and it wouldn't affect things like carbon and hydrogen, which are going to be more present, but that's like real technical, like, and I'm totally happy just to kind of like nerd out and like read this paper by myself, Be unless yeah. you know, unless you have the you answer off the top of your head. <laughs> I, I do not, right? So yeah, cool. I would say read read the paper, and I want to hear what what are your subsequent thoughts. And because uh, Julio Fonte, he's uh, really interested in this. I'm going to be doing a panel discussion on the carbon fourteen dating on Ooh. April twelfth. 
uh, bringing on all the experts, uh, Bob Rucker, Joe Marino, Michael Kowalski, who's the head of the BSTS newsletter uh, right now, uh, and um, who, uh, Thomas McAvoy will be on. And as well, your favorite trout skeptic, uh, Jordan, hey. the nuclear engineer. From, from reason to doubt, he's going to be going to be the shroud skeptic for that episode. Give Hugh a rest, but uh, cool. <laughs> so, cool, that's exciting. So, all right, cool. So, so yeah, that that's my case on the carbon dating. I, do do you think? I guess my hope for you with the carbon dating is, given you as the skeptic have the burden of proof here, have I done enough to at least make you? say okay i've got to suspend judgment i need to i i don't have a way to say yes it is probably medieval in light of everything well i guess it tell me if i'm like um going about this wrong but the way that i view it is that i'm going to have to um i'm gonna have to decide what i think is more likely that that date trend of 35 years per like half a centimeter or whatever mm. the trend was what's what's mm. more likely that trend is not in fact a trend and that if we actually carbon dated more material, we, we would not see that trend or that that trend does continue because then we would need something to explain it and regular old carbon dating would not explain that at all. And then something like this hypothesis here is going to wind up looking a whole lot more attractive. But if I just kind of assume that it's more likely that that trend doesn't continue even we and like admitted we don't have evidence that that trend continues but we also don't have evidence that the neutron absorption hypothesis is actually correct right all that we're saying is that if it was correct then we would see this trend continue if this trend does continue right i think so I, the, the only thing is with with facts 5 uh through 6 and and 7 as well again that 7 is, is controversial based on whether you think the forensic evidence proves a link between the two clots. I think it works, but Jordan doesn't, for example. I, I don't know your position on the sudarium, but um, I, I think that factors five through it. seven, no problem. I, I think that factors five through seven give us um, empirical reason to favor the the fact that the trend continues over over otherwise. Without, without factors five through seven, I think that both hypotheses are equally probable, empirically speaking. Um, and I also bring in, you know, philosophical argumentation as to why, obviously, I, I'm assuming God exists. I, I'm assuming it's obviously um, takes place within a religion authenticating context, the Shroud, right? It, it attests to the Jesus of the Gospels, his death and resurrection, which are essential beliefs. And given that context, that's why I'm saying, well, it... it Philosophically speaking, it would be equally probable that God could have done a miracle in this case to explain this this data. Uh, it's not like saying, you know, well, what's the prior probability that God would have randomly done a miracle? Well, that's that's a low prior prob, but the prior probability that God would have committed a religion authenticating miracle in a context that is a religion authenticating one that's equally probable in my book. So. Yeah, that's how I would make that argument that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have like this whole like epistemological concern with um, like kind of theism at large because I, I feel like if I became convinced of theism instead of being the agnostic that I am, all of a sudden I would kind of have to say like, well, actually all bets are off about everything. Like I don't know if I could make statements about prior probability. You know what I mean? Because like I would simply have no idea what no. God's priors were would be in any given situation um see i don't think i don't think that i hear that all the time i don't think and i'm sorry this is on the shroud but i don't think that follows at all because look it was an atheist val vol the atheist who who provides an argument for the prior probability being low in general in terms of random based on god's mo right like god has set up the laws of nature we know god's modus operandi is to uphold the laws of nature unless he has a sufficient reason and that that's why i think the religion authenticating context provides us with a sufficient reason to over to overwhelm it's not just a you know the prior problem that god would just randomly say you know what i'm gonna create a miracle with these shroud images just no reason out of the blue no that that's highly improbable given god's modus operandi of upholding the laws of nature but all bets are off in a religion authenticating context so yeah that that's how i would come back to that 
Yeah, I could see that. I like. I think that the the worry for me would persist just because I would be afraid that I am totally misunderstanding the mind of God, and that seems like it would be like a fairly easy thing to do because He's God. You know what I mean? Like I'd be I'd be like really worried about um, placing credence and like thinking about what He would or wouldn't do because. You know what I mean? Like, I would just be worried about it, I guess. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. Well, go ahead. I was going to say, um, I want you to respond to that. But then after you do respond to that, um, do you mind if we take a couple quick questions from the audience before we move on to point two? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm good to go. Good to go now with the questions if you want. Oh, so. cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the first one is... What does the shroud imply about the nature of the resurrection and what type of being described in physical terms would Christ be? I think that this is a really good question after we just finished talking about all that neutron absorption stuff. Yeah. So, okay. So what does the shroud imply about the nature of the resurrection? So um, essentially the, the, sh the shroud, it would depend on uh, how the images were formed and Obviously, as you can tell from my answer to the carbon, right, that's explained by neutron irradiation, the neutrons within Jesus's body is the hypothesis that I and Bob Brucker go for and several others as well. Uh, there's a lot of radiation people thinking that that's the explanation. In terms of the images, I'm thinking it would be charged particles, something like protons, because protons, unlike neutrons, would not penetrate the cloth. They would just go on the superficial layer of the cloth and create uh, you know, go in accordance with um, Bob's mechanism where it would create sort of an electrical discharge. And that's what actually colors the surface fibers of the um, the shroud cloth itself, which are features of the shroud images, right? So it's only on the top two to three fibrils of each thread. On each fibril, the fibrils have the thickness of a human hair. It's only 0 0.2 microns or micrometers or uh, so this is, ex it's the primary cell wall. That is extremely, extremely superficial. Um, the color is is uniform on the images. Um, it's also uh, embeds depth information or topographical information. That's the 3D images. Um, we also know the shroud's body images were encoded. Whatever mechanism encoded them was strictly vertical, either a rectilinear process or a curvy linear process, like a curveball, goes out and then comes back into that strict vertical direction. So th there are vertically mapped wrapping distortions. Well, what what travels in vertical radiation? So th this is part partly, I, I think, in terms of the nature of the resurrection, it would suggest, well, what what was involved uh, in the mechanism of resurrection? Well, it involved some sort of radiation from the body uh, of Jesus. Uh, so that's an implication that the shroud would have for the nature of the resurrection. Um, what type of being described in physical terms uh, would Christ be? Uh, so I'm not I'm not sure what exactly he's asking here in physical terms. What type of being? So do you know what he means? I, I do a little bit. Um, so there is a debate among theologians about what exactly Jesus's body would have been like after the resurrection. Would his body have been like, like how my body is right now, where it's, you know, it's got all the normal <laughs> composition of, you know, I've got organs and skin and all this stuff. Or was his resurrection more like, was his body just kind of like completely something that let him appear and disappear and walk through walls and stuff like that? Um, and like, there's, yes. there's hints in the, you know, Jesus kind of appears and disappears, right. Um, yeah. in, in, in the new, in the text of the new Testament. Um, so he, a lot of people kind of think like, I don't think his body would have been very much. I don't think that his body would have been very similar at all to how his body was pre-resurrection. Um, and maybe there's some clues to that in the shroud. What do you think? Yeah, so so I, I I mean it's it's in the Gospels. I definitely agree that Jesus's body he had a glorious physical resurrection body. So this was a, a physical body that could obey the laws of physics within our three dimensional space and and time dimension. That's the thing. But obviously, it also has extra dimensional capabilities. Perhaps right. That's how he's able to walk through walls and stuff like that. So 
In terms of the relevance for shroud studies, um, John Jackson, as well as Mark Antionacci, they, they believe that at the moment of the resurrection, when this radiation pulse or burst happened from the body, at the mo precise moment of the resurrection, the body became mechanically transparent. And that's why it passed through the shroud cloth. So that's similar to him passing through walls and locked doors later on in the gospel, resurrection appearances and stuff. So that's the only thing that I, I think that the shroud would have relevance in terms of saying what type of physical body, uh, you know, was was there anything that would have been glorious about it? Because um, again, we Jesus is definitely in a still in a state of dead. He he's not he's not been risen to life yet at the moment the images have been formed. Um, but we know that there's some kind of supernatural radiation that's forming these images. And he would have had to have become mechanically transparent in some sense. Otherwise, how did he get out of the, the shroud cloth to begin with? So that's all I think we can glean on that question from the shroud directly. Cool, cool. Um, I've got a question from, where'd it go? I've got another one from <laughs> Daniel. Let me pull that one up. Okay. Daniel says he's trying to understand how we are uniting natural and supernatural phenomenon. If we can measure them naturally, how are they supernatural? Asking as somebody who believes in the in the crucified risen one. Da Daniel is Catholic, so he he believes okay. in you know he he affirms ninety nine point well ninety five percent of all the same stuff as any Christian would. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think this is pretty pretty easy to to understand, right? Like so so for example, the vir the virgin birth that's actually a misnomer. It was, it's the virgin conception, right? The miracle was the conception, right? So. That initial, the Holy Spirit, um, you know, of creating that that moment of conception, that's the supernatural aspect. After that, the laws of nature take over and Mary has a pregnancy. I, well, OK, so I'm a Protestant. So I would say Mary has a pregnancy and a birth like any other woman, totally natural, consistent with the laws of nature. And it's the same with the Shroud of Turin. So Bob Rucker has actually uh, calculated this. Out and and the the supernatural moment of the resurrection that that instant uh, is only about a femtosecond long. So there's a femtosecond of a supernatural event. Then after that, everything is consistent with the laws of physics. And Bob has calculated this and demonstrated that the laws of nature can explain every other aspect of what happens subsequent to that initial supernatural femtosecond. So. Yeah, that that's how I would say the the supernatural and natural relate. That the supernatural event takes place in a fraction of a second, uh, and then the laws of nature take over, just as they, they do in the case of any other miracle. Uh, so yeah, cool. And then I, I found it. Um, Captive Desk says this miracle seems like it would have been mentioned in the Bible. So my question to you, Dale, is: Is it mentioned in the Bible? that the miracle itself like the the so bear in mind nobody's in the tomb to witness like the forming of the images themselves right now it's it's a valid question to ask but if there were images if there are remnants of this miracle left and they were visible to the things wouldn't we expect them to mention these remar remarkable images and that sort of thing right so there have been various answers that pro shroud people get. So someone like Barry Schwartz will say, well, no, they wouldn't. In a Jewish context, they wouldn't mention the images. Why? Because that would be idolatry. They, they would try to seize the shroud and destroy it, right? So they, they'll appeal to either it would have been seen as idolatry or it would have violated, you guys are Catholics, so you know about the discipline of the secret. Um, you know, they, basically they, the authorities would have captured this and, and destroyed it if they knew that, Christians were going around preaching, look, we've got these amazing miracle images and stuff like that. So that's one answer. A second answer, one that I um, lean to myself, is that perhaps the images, they don't mention the images. Why? Because there were no images. So under if these radiation theories were true, it is it depending on the doses and, and everything like that, it could take decades. And uh, Mark Antinacci uh, has worked with physicist Dr. Arthur Lynn and argued that even over a century before the image, body images at least, would have become visible. 
Uh, again, that depends on a whole bunch of variables that we don't know and stuff, but that's another possible answer to this question. There, there were no images. That's why they don't mention it. It took time, just like your newspaper doesn't instantly turn yellow when left out in the sun. It takes time for that ultraviolet radiation to color the newspaper from white to yellow. Well, it would be the same principle here. The th a third answer here is to just say, you know, what are you talking about, Willis? The Bible does mention the shroud images. And on that front, I've had an expert, Larry Stolle, on, who's um, a biblical scholar. Uh, he actually did a debate with Dr. Ben Witherington III on my Shroud Wars panel. Ben Witherington is a skeptic that the Bible mentions it, but Larry lays out the case that there are certain texts, such as Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, which directly mention the shroud images, right? So it says something about you know, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your very eyes that Christ was publicly portrayed. And like the Greek word there is the same word that's used for public declarations, you know, that would have been posted in public for everyone to see with their normal eyes. He was publicly portrayed as crucified. So this is probably the strongest um, biblical text that can be made the case that well, the Bible does mention shroud images. It doesn't come right out and say it. It mentions them cryptically in association with the discipline of the secret. But there are actual mentions in the Bible. So that's that's debatable in terms of whether there's no mention or not of these images. So I hope that helps. Um, we'll do one more from Daniel and then maybe move on to the next topic. Um, sure. And Daniel's question is, um, can the cross and the crucifixion perhaps still be a scandalon, the Greek word for scandal, as St. Paul mentions, if we have undeniable physical proof of the resurrection, it would seem it would be the opposite of a scandal. And I'm wondering if your answer, Dale, might be something like what you were just talking about. Perhaps there was no image on the shroud in the first century. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you, you can do that as well, right? But can the cross still be a scandal, as St. Paul maintains, if we have undeniable physical proof of the resurrection? Well, it would still be a scandal to the Jewish mind, right? The unbeliever. I mean, remember, they, they had no proof that these images were miraculous. Even if, assuming for the sake of argument, they were showing shrouded, but they've got images on the cloth. For, for centuries, we've had images in the cloth. Like in the medieval ages, they didn't have a stirp group who scientifically tested and proved all of the physical and chemical features that we know about today. Um, so they didn't necessarily have proof of a miracle to give. So if you're an outsider, a Jew, an unbelieving Jew, and someone says, hey, look, look what I got, like their their normal reaction would be like, ew, that, that thing was touching a corpse. Get that thing away from me. Uh, they're not going to be like, whoa, that a miracle. That must have been formed by a resurrection. Like I that wouldn't be my immediate reaction. I wouldn't expect that to be the immediate reaction of a of a Jew. They would need to be talked into thinking it was some kind of a miracle somehow, right? So, yeah. Cool. I think that's great. Um, do you want to move on to the second reason that I presented in my video? Why I, I think do. the Shroud is medieval? I do, I do, yes. All right. How am I doing so far? I hope I'm doing all right. Oh, perfect. And the audience is loving it, and that's the important part. So, um, Awesome. Okay. I should go ahead and skip over to around the three-minute, ten-second mark, and then I'll hit play, and please interrupt me. Audience, if you can't hear it, and Dale, if you can't, but everyone should be able to. And the radiocarbon dating is corroborated in the historical dating. The shroud first emerged historically in 1354, in 1389, when it went on exhibition, it was denounced as false by the local Bishop of Troyes, who declared it cunningly painted, the truth being attested by the artist who painted it. So this points to both the fact that the shroud is medieval and art. And then the most common rebuttal to that from people in the pro-shroud crowd is they'll point to the Hungarian Prey Codex, and say, hey, look, the Hungarian Prey Codex predates that 1354 date, and that's got to be the Shroud of Turin in the Hungarian Prey Codex, right? I don't buy it, and I'm going to let uh, a brand new podcast that I just discovered uh, explain why. This is from and, the Shroud of Turin is not... And so then I'll just kind of show the pictures, but this is from 
Um, so that that's Jordan there uh, from Reason to Doubt. Um, super nice guy and will be on your show, Dale, in a couple weeks. April 12th. April 12th, yeah. Nice, nice. Um, so I guess the only point that I'll make here, I guess, is that um, the Hungarian Prey Codex um, depicts, you can actually kind of like see it um, on the bottom of the screen there. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, some people were looking at that and saying like, hey, this this document is considerably older than um, that memo from the Bishop of, uh, uh, of that town in France or whatever. And it's depicting what appears to be the shroud. Um, and the points that Jordan was making here was that it really appears to be a cover to a tomb instead of a shroud. Um, and that the pattern on the cover um, is repeated in a lot of other, uh, I guess, works of art that are depicting tombs instead of shrouds. Um, so I think I essentially clear, like, I, I think that was the whole point that I made in that version of the video. Um, so with mm -hmm. that back to Dale and I'll go ahead and pull up the slides. All right, perfect. So, so yeah, so you basically played uh, two aspects with respect to dating. So the first is the, uh, outside of the carbon dating, this is the second and only other, um, well, uh, I should say there is a third one, but this is the second um, direct evidence from the skeptic. So the skeptic has the burden of proof, claiming that they can prove the shroud is in fact medieval. And this is the, in fact, the first evidence that ever existed. It's, it is a historical document called the Darcy Memorandum. So it dates to the year 1389. Uh, some people date it 1390, doesn't matter. 1389 is the major consensus view. And this was a, a memo that was written allegedly by Bishop Pierre Darcy. Uh, he was the Bishop of Troyes uh, in France, which was uh, close to Leary, France, which Leary was the first place allegedly that the shroud was exhibited, at least in medieval France. Uh, and that's, you know, when everyone, including shroud skeptics, say that the shroud dates from the 1350s. So about 40 years later, in 1389, Bishop Pierre Darcy is writing this memorandum. Uh, it's important to note it is unsigned. It's undated. We have no proof that Pierre Darcy ever wrote this. There, there's no mention in any of the historical records, even dating with Nicholas Camoset in the 1600s, who was meticulous. And all, we know all of the records historically were kept until Nicholas's time. There was no fire or warfare that would have destroyed part the partial records camuset makes no mention of this letter uh from pierre darcy so there, there's a question of look did this guy even write this there's also a question of in fact it's not even a question we know he never even sent this letter but in this letter or in this memorandum he's claiming quote unquote about 34 years ago his predecessor bishop henry de potier apparently held an official inquiry into the Shroud of Trin being exhibited in this church in Leary, France. And Pierre uh, Darcy here is upset because he's saying, you know, they're stealing all the money. They're, you know, this church is outside of my jurisdiction, so they're stealing the pilgrims, they're getting the money, um, and, and they're basically showing this fraud. And we know that the Shroud is fraud. Why? Because my predecessor, 34 years ago, had an official inquiry, during that inquiry, the artist came up and admitted or said that the shroud images were cunningly painted images. Uh, so that's what the evidence is on the shroud skeptics side. And Kevin has apparently gone all in on this, and he thinks this proves that the shroud is probably medieval. Um, how, I'm out of curiosity, how confident are you that it's medieval based on this evidence? Um. And don't I, look at my responses. Don't cheat. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't love assigning. And so I, I don't love assigning like numbers to credences. Cause I feel like those are like very subjective. Um, but I think that like, if I was going to say like, which one does the heavy lifting for me between the carbon dating and the memorandum, I think that the carbon dating does a lot more for me than the memorandum. Like as in, if the carbon dating was proven to be like, you know, just uh, like if they redid it and it got a totally different number, I would pretty quickly do away with the, um, the Darcy memo. 
Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the, the counter wouldn't be true. Like if if the DRC memo was proven to be like, you know, a, a forgery or something like that, like it was actually written in 1975, um, I wouldn't like uh, that. That probably wouldn't change me as much. So I don't know if that was exactly the question you were asking. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's it's more probable than not, but it's it's weak evidence for you, kind of thing. I guess, right? Like it's yeah. It's not very probable or something. Yeah. Like I think that the the, um, the memo from the Bishop of Troy is great in so far as it uh, it it backs up the radiocarbon dating, um, and it's it's the first time that we have like definitive mention of it. Um, and so that's, that's cool. Um, but yeah, okay. I, I definitely lean towards like empir. I like empirical evidence more than I like, like testimonial evidence, I suppose. Um, so if like, you know, if I was going to assign like percentages, which again, I, I don't love to do, but I would say something like, um, my confidence is motivated by, uh, the, the radiocarbon dating like 80% and the memo like 20% or some, something like that. Like, so. And again, I don't know if that's exactly the question that you were asking, but that's how I interpreted it. Fair, fair enough. No, okay, cool. I just wanted, I was just genuinely curious as to where you stand. Okay, so a uh, last question to you, and then I'll, I'll give my case. So I always give this with Shroud Skeptics. I call it the Gospel of Mark comparison test, right? So so alleged, if I grant you everything you want, at the end of the day, we've got a historical document written by one peep uh, in th- about 40 years after the events they describe. Uh, well, guess what? I've got this other historical document the gospel of mark it was written about 40 years after the events it describes do you just believe that jesus rose from the dead and that everything in the gospel of mark is true simply because we have this document from 40 years after the event yeah i think that's a great question the answer is obviously no i don't blindly trust the gospel of mark but what what i will say for both is that i'm pretty willing to take both of them at face value for claims that aren't crazy um and, you know, I'm, I'm not a Jesus mythicist. Like, I think that the Gospel of Mark is fine evidence for the existence of the historical Jesus. And I also think it's, I think it's great evidence for the fact that Jesus had friends whose names were Peter and Andrew and Matthew. You know, I think that, I think that there's like, you know, great evidence presented in the Gospels for things like that. But having a friend named Peter, well, a friend named Simon, I guess, isn't... Um, crazy <laughs> uh gotcha. so so i guess i i trust them both relatively the same it's just that one um makes some pretty unusual claims that i find harder to believe and the other one never makes any super unusual claims i guess okay okay so that's cool so that that's good maybe some other time we'll work on your philosophical uh issues i think because that's that's really where it's stemming you know, cool. you know this difference between crazy or supernatural versus not so, all right, cool. So um, the point obviously there is that, look, his, secular historians, whether an event is said to be crazy or not, historians don't just look at a document and just say, yep, it's written in a document. I guess it must be true, right? They they have certain criteria of authenticity. They, they evaluate certain documents. And on this front, the major, majority of PhD historians do not accept this document as authentic. And there are several reasons for this, right? So In the first place, we have actual evidence as to a motive as to why this guy would lie. So this should cause at least reasonable doubts, right? Basically, uh, Darcy, right, he ascribes greed to the Leary Church, stealing pilgrims, taking money. Well, why is that an issue? Well, it's because he is the one that needs money. So in uh, Christmas, uh, around Christmas time that year, there was a major, I think it was an earthquake, uh, and that destroyed one of his stained glass windows and in his cathedral, those are expensive as heck to repair. Um, we also, Jack, uh, historian uh, Jack Markwort actually looked, because uh, Shroud skeptic Hugh Ferry, he said, oh no, this is this is just a pro-Shroud talking point. It's total bonk, he didn't need money. You're, you're just lying about it, right? Well, Hugh Ferry was proven wrong because historian Jack Markwort looked into the finances. We have those records and it proves, yes, this guy was, in dire need of money. So there is a proven motive for this guy to lie. Does that prove he did lie or not? No. Go ahead. Um, 
I, I would imagine that passing off the shroud as being authentic would be like a shorter path to money because then it would attract more pilgrims and stuff, right? And I mean, if he's if he's a bishop, that means that you know, to a large extent, he's making money when the church is making money. Um, but right? it's no, because he the, the Leary Church was a special church; it was outside of his jurisdiction. So, all even though it was in his area, he got none of the money that went directly to the dean of Leary and stuff like that. And that's why he was so mad. And if you look at the external evidences, we've got letters from him about this, uh, that even before this memorandum was written, where he's, he's contacted everyone. He wants the Pope to get the shroud and give it to him. The Pope says, get out of here. So he goes to the King of France. He, he even brings a Bailey to try and steal the shroud and, and bring it to him. So we, we do have external documents that speak as well to his mindset. But, um, Go ahead. We don't. So Darcy was not the bishop of um, the diocese or the archdiocese in which the shroud was no. was kept. No, he had okay. no jurisdiction there. Okay, uh, so okay. that's yeah. He's they're directly I thought he was. Okay, he's not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. So, so that's the motivation aspect. Then, as I was saying, we. We also have, look, the, there's no independent evidence, right? Um, all of the external documents, not only do they uh, lack the details, which would be expected. So, for example, if, if there was an official inquiry, we would have records of this in the in the archive, the Vatican archives, for example, right? We would have letters, uh, correspondence where they quote from this official inquiry. Bishop Pierre Darcy was a, a meticulous lawyer. We have other letters that he's written where he meticulously quotes and dates everything. You know, and he's got the, he doesn't quote, he doesn't even name this unnamed artist that supposedly confessed. We have no records um, of this uh, official inquiry. We have no records of who this supposed artist was in any of the external documents. So. It's just weird. Why, why does the Pope know nothing about this official inquiry um, that supposedly took place? Why does no one quote about it, despite there being several, I think about seven or eight letters, directly speaking about this controversy at this time? That, I think we would expect, we can prove historically, we would expect a mention of an official inquiry where an artist said, yep, the, I, I painted this, or yes, it is painted. There's. Go ahead. We have letters regarding the shroud prior to 1389. Yes. Are so you sure? 100%. 100%. So in the so in the first place, um, yeah, we have uh, the Pope from Anti Pope Clement the Seventh uh, giving a brief to Geoffrey the Second, which dates to July 28th, 1389. So just so you know, this memorandum. This probably dates, according to historians, sometime between August 5th, because we, we have a, another letter from King, the King of France uh, dated August 4th, and then we have uh, this memo seems to come in between August 5th and before August 15th. That's when the historians uh, think that's the best, most likely date for this memo. Uh, so yeah, we've got two letters from 1389 written prior to this and then we've got about four to five letters including papal bulls uh dated after this in the immediate vicinity um and then here's the most important letter that i'm going to say uh we have a letter from bishop henry de portier right and bishop henry that's the one who have supposedly the predecessor who held this official inquiry and what's telling about him is he wrote the, a letter about a few months before uh, Jeffrey died. Jeffrey the first was the first owner of the Leary Church and the Shroud, who was exhibiting it, right? And uh, Bishop Henry directly contradicts what Bishop Pierre Darcy says. He says, guess what? The Leary Church, you guys are amazing. I hereby certify and ratify everything that you guys are doing in terms of and they, they reference, Jack Markwort makes this argument, they reference the divine cult, right? So what is the divine cult? Well, the, the, old, the Leary Church had a bunch of relics, but nothing related to a divine cult. The only candidate is the shroud, because that's related to Jesus. So 
Um, yeah, I, I think that we have the primary source uh, implicitly contradicting Darcy's claims. I mean, ima imagine saying like, yes, the Leary Church, you guys are awesome. But yet just a, a year before you had had this official inquiry and you you would expose the scam and stuff like that. that. That doesn't make sense. The word cult there has a there's there's a normal usage for that word in Catholicism, and it's generally referring to the worship of either a saint or a Marian apparition. Um, so like uh, canonizations are the recognition of cults. I know it sounds weird to non-Catholics, but um, generally like uh, like if you read literature about our, our Lady of Guadalupe, they will talk about the cult of Our Lady of Tepayac prior to her title, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, and saints, too, will have cults, and the cults will worship the saints at a local level prior to, like, global approval by the Vatican. Um, so I I would love to, like, I should read so, into this more. Yeah, but the word... No, I, I will send you a link. So I, I did a debate where they, Jack Mark, were specific, Hugh Ferry raised this point specifically, and Jack Mark were refuted it, and hmm. Hugh Ferry changed his mind. Um, so that that's on my Real Seekers channel. It is a debate between Hugh Ferry and Jack Markwort. Um, I'll, maybe I'll send you the link. You can put it in the video description. That'd be awesome. I forget what what the arguments were that that resulted in that, so I can't uh, say them here. But that point was specifically addressed and dealt with by the historian Jack Markwort. So yeah, okay. uh, and Hugh changed his mind. So okay, great. The ultimate shroud skeptic uh, admits he was wrong. Um, oh. But yeah, um, the one thing I'll say about this with the external documents, uh, something that helps the Shroud skeptics is we do see the Pope waffling, right? So the, the first thing he does, he, he fully supports. The first letter we get is he's fully supporting. He doesn't come out and explicitly say, yes, the Shroud is authentic, but he is fully supporting everything the Leary Church is doing. And he's saying, keep doing what you're doing in terms of the, exhibi the exhibitions and all this stuff. Then we get these complaints. It, it seems like the Pope is, is becoming aware of Bishop Darcy's complaints and the fact that he's getting the King of France involved in all this. Then all of a sudden, the Pope changes his tune in 1390, I believe it was, January of 1390. And he says, okay, look, Leary Church, keep showing the shroud, but just make sure to announce in a loud voice that it is not the actual shroud of cloth, but it is a representation of the burial cloth. So that that's used by shroud skeptics to say, well, see, the Pope's admitting it's a fake. But what's funny is six months later, the Pope completely reverses himself and again says, um, let me, I can actually look it up, but six months later, Clement changed his mind. He again supports the Leary Shroud, making no mention of idolatry, uh, doesn't say they have to make any uh, qualifications or restrictions in terms of what uh, pilgrimage or enlarging the indulgence for the faithful who visit uh, the church annually at Christmas. Uh, and he strictly prohibits anyone from usurping the offerings of the faithful and uh, per, uh, condemns Bishop Darcy to perpetual silence on the matter. So uh, we, uh, Jack Markwart's done a lot of work trying to figure out well, what, what is going on? Why is the Pope waffling back and forth? It's not because, oh, he's got proof that the Shroud is a fake or something like that. It's, it's all political, right? So basically, in the 1350s, the Pope is cool to go with what's going on in terms of the exhibitions. No problems, nothing. Once Darcy starts raising issues, um, the Pope issues a bull, and he, he says there's a specific Latin phrase. I, I forget what it is, but it's, it's under, uh, with secret knowledge, basically saying, like, look, I am going to say this, but I'm doing so because I've got secret knowledge that I can't reveal to you as to why I'm saying what I'm saying. And then six months later, he totally reverses himself and supports the shroud. Well, what was going on? Well, it was at this time that the Pope and the emperor of the Byzantine Byzantines, the Byzantine emperor was a Catholic and he wanted to unif reunify the church. And that's why the Pope is like, oh, oh my gosh, I can't have this controversy or scandal. It's it's going to fall apart. If, if I admit um, that we have this shroud and we got it from Constantinople, they're going to want it back. And if I say no, then the churches aren't going to be reunified. Uh, and if I say yes, 
my gosh, we're going to be losing the Shroud of Christ. I don't want to lose that. Um, so this provides a historical, historically plausible explanation as to why the Pope's waffly. And once that deal fell through and reunification was impossible, six months later, the Pope is back to supporting the pro-Shroud side. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it. Do you think that it's also like historically plausible that the waffling is due to the fact that the, the Pope is pretty sure that this thing is not authentic, but he really likes the money that it's bringing in? This happened all the time in the medieval church with like, you know, relics of the true cross and stuff like that. Um, the breast milk of the Virgin Mary. I know that sounds gross to a modern audience, but people would travel like hundreds and hundreds of miles to go see the relic of the breast milk of the Virgin Mary. Yeah. Um, so this, yeah. this kind of stuff happened all the time back then. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't always, uh, you know, a kibosh was not always put on it by the church because it brought in good money. And it's, I'm going to mute myself because I have to cough really bad. No problem. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, again, it, it's clear from the Pope's waffling that, look, he is not basing his decisions and what he's saying in these papal bulls on the basis of an official inquiry whereby it was proven it was a fake. The artist confessed like that there would be no waffling whatsoever, right? It was already been proven to be a fake. So I, I think this is proof. His waffling is proof that there was no such evidence. Darcy was lying about that inquiry. It never happened. And he's just playing politics. And there are various hypotheses as to as to what those are. I like Jack Mark Wart's hypothesis, which is it's called the simony theory. So that's the one I think is the best. But look, when it comes to the medieval history of the Shroud, there are a total of 17 historical hypotheses explaining the Shroud's whereabouts from 1204 to 1390. So there, there's room for, for disagreement, I would say, even on the pro-Shroud side. So Simony is the sin of selling, um, like making money off of religious items, right? Correct. Yeah. So like selling the holy water from lords would be, and like making a profit off of it would be simony, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and, it's yeah. Th- th- it goes back to how like how did the shroud get it, get to France and stuff? I don't know. Do you, do you want me to go into that or? Sure, or, if you want, if you think that fits in good here, like uh, like your theories for how the shroud got to France. Yeah. So so basically, um, I I think that the shroud even after the Fourth Crusade stayed in Constantinople, and we have historical documents mentioning the burial shrouds up until. The Latin emperors were overthrown in 1261 with with Baldwin and stuff, right? And Baldwin, uh, he was basically going bankrupt and all this stuff, and he had a relationship with King Louis of France. We know historically it's it's not controversial. He sold something like 22 relics to uh, King Louis, and that was in the Saint Chapelle uh, uh, reliquary in in Paris, France, or whatever, right? So that's not controversial, but that's the sin of simony, right? You you can't sell relics like this. So they con- concocted a scheme. And again, this isn't historically speculation. Every historian with a PhD agrees this happened for these relics. It's just questionable did it happen for the shroud. But uh, basically they said, okay, look, I'm me, Baldwin, as the emperor of the Byzantines, I'm going to set up this scheme where I'm going to borrow money from the Venetians. The Venetians are heretics. They've been excommunicated by the Pope because of their role in the Fourth Crusade. Um, So I'm going to borrow money from them, and then I'm going to default on that. But I'm going to put up as collateral this relic. And when I can't pay pay off the the loan, I'm going to default. The Venetians are going to say, well, give us that relic as collateral, then fork it over. And I'm going to say, oh my gosh, I can't give a relic to a bunch of heretics. King Louis, please help me. Give me the money. Pay the money to the Venetians. And because I'm so grateful, I'm going to give you as a gift this relic. So the sin of simony technically never happened. That was their workaround. And <laughs> very um, clever. Yeah, well, it, it worked. The Pope was cool with it, apparently. So uh, <laughs> he, he got away with it. But um, so it was a kind of a similar thing with the shroud, although there was a difference. So Baldwin got captured by the Egyptians or sorry, his son or something like that got captured by the Egyptians. And they wanted a ransom. So King, so once again, um, uh, Baldwin from uh, B- the Byzantine Empire was like, okay, Louis, bail out, pay the ransom for this guy. And I'm going to give you the Shroud of Turin as 
a thank you, a free gift saying thank you so much for freeing him, right? But in this case, it, it wasn't um, it wasn't directly saving the relic from heretics, so it qualified as the sin of simony, and they didn't realize it until after the exchange happened. And once the lawyers found out, they they said, "Oh my gosh, you you can't claim this relic because that's going to qualify as simony and and stuff like that." And so that's why there was a hush hush, and they kept it hidden. Um, and and yeah, basically gave it to Jeffrey de Charny who eventually, once the controversy had calmed down in the 1350s, he started showing it. Um, yep, there's a big simony loophole and stuff. Anyway, so, but that's one out of 17 hypotheses and stuff like that. But uh, Cool. Yeah, another, another thing, last thing on this memorandum that I want to say is, look, modern science, including the carbon-14, contradicts the claims of this, uh, the claims of this thing, right? So... Yeah, sorry. How are we doing on time? Am I okay? I'll, I'll speed up a bit. But, yeah, no, um, no, no, we're we're good. I was just uh, what time is it now? Eight ten. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to think of like the audience. I don't want the audience to get super burned out. But <laughs> fair enough. So okay, I'll, okay. So basically, as I'll find out in a further thing, we Sterp has proven that the shroud is not cunningly painted. It is not a painting. Um, so that directly contradicts as well with the carbon 14 dating um that that actually contradicts this because the darcy memorandum says that the shroud was made in the 1350s about 34 years prior when the artist cunningly painted it now believe it or not even hugh ferry has calculated out that the carbon 14 dates simply rule it is impossible scientifically speaking for the shroud to have been created anytime uh, in the 1350s or 1340s, the carbon dating does not allow for those dates. And and again, I, I did a show on this. Like uh, That's why Hugh Ferry will date it sometime in 1290 to 1320 is when he thinks the shroud images were created. So this Darcy memorandum saying that the, sh the artist painted it 34 years ago, scientifically impossible given the carbon 14 dates. Uh, it can't be true. That's the last thing I wanted to say. Two, two quick questions there. My understanding wasn't that the um, the investigation by uh, Bishop uh, Poirier, Portier wasn't that the shroud was painted during the investigation, just that it was painted sometime prior to the investigation and that the artist was still living. That's kind of how I understood it. Gotcha. Okay, so... Again, you still have to make that consistent with the carbon-14 data, right? Which uh, precludes really a post-1320 date for the making of the of, of, or for the making of the cloth itself, right? Because that's what they're dating the cloth, not the images. But oh yeah, that's... Um, so so then it just becomes a question of the age of the artist and, and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah, the, yeah. And I'm also so that's an issue. Yeah, and I'm also not so convinced about such a narrow range of like 1290 to 1320 or something like that. Um, only because um, I remember that that 95% confidence level is not actually well founded. We might need something more like a 90, not 95% confidence level if we want to um, ascribe that same uh, date range. And then like all of a sudden we're talking about like there's a 10% there's a chance that it's actually a decade off or something like that. Um, so like that, that's why I'm, I'm not like, I would be skeptical of somebody trying to tell me that we know, like, you know, within three decades when the, the cloth was created, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I'd be skeptical yeah. of something so yeah. precise. Yeah. I, th I, I think uh, like Hugh Ferry, for example, he, he thinks that the shroud was made around 1290. That that's just his best guess. There's one of the available uh, positions right so if that was true well this artist would have to have lived until 1350s when supposedly this inquiry took place and he testified and there's there is an argument based on the ages that that is very unlikely to be true because he would have lived to his 80s or 90s or something like that so there's an argument there it's just the a probabilistic one it's not an iron proof disproof or anything but um most people didn't live that long, so that would be rare. 
but it's not like the artist would have to have been alive when the shroud was like when the actual cloth was created right like it i've almost definitely written on like things that were manufactured before i was born right like if i grabbed a random notebook from my parents house when i was 15 that notebook may have been like like a my mom had like a um uh a a uh, like a little notebook of recipes that was probably from the I don't know when she was 18 or something like that. So it would have been like from the seventies or whatever. Um, and yeah, that's a fair point. I, I, you know, I take your point. Yeah. So, so yeah, he, the artist could have just done art on a piece of cloth that was older than he was. And that, you know, that doesn't seem insane. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I take your point there. Yeah. Fair enough. So, okay. I'll retract that. That's all I have to say on the, the memo. Um, the oh. Hungarian pre codex. You yes. also mentioned that. Um, so I'll, I'll quickly go over that yeah. just so I'm not boring. And as a but... reminder to the audience, um, the Hungarian Prey Codex is something that some people point to as evidence of the Shroud prior to the 14th century, like, and you know, the 13th century. Um, because the Hungarian Prey Codex is from the year... What year is the Hungarian Prey Codex from again? Between 1192 to 1195. Okay, so it's, it's 100 years earlier then we think the shroud was created. And so if we have these images of the shroud from a hundred years earlier, then clearly something's not adding up. And now all of a sudden, you know, the, the, you know, the evidence is mounting for the shroud being older than what the radiocarbon dating is suggesting. I presented this evidence super briefly in my video and explained why I didn't buy it. And now just with that reminder kind of out of the way, Dale, take it away. Perfect. So, so this is a pro shroud claim. So on, on this front, it's us, the pro shroud guys that have a burden of proof um, to, to prove that, yeah, that this uh, proves that the shroud is not medieval in the sense that it doesn't date to the, you know, 12, the late 1200s to mid 1300s and that sort of thing. It, it dates back at least a century and a half earlier, um, or perhaps goes back even further to 30 AD. Now, the first argument in favor of the Hungarian Prey Codex is, is there is an argument from scholarly consensus. Now, I don't mean most historians generally speaking, but I would say that most scholars who've specifically studied art history and the Prey Codex in its relation to the Shroud in depth, most of those experts uh, agree that the Pre Hungarian Prey Codex images were made based on copying the images from the Shroud of Turin. Um, so I just want to make that that consensus. Uh, it's a qualified consensus there. And if you actually go to the next slide, I'll show you. There's only about 12. That Oh, okay. So here's a picture of the Hungarian Prey Codex. So you have two panels. You have the upper panel, which is the anointing of Jesus scene. And then you have the bottom panel, which is the three Marys at the tomb. Um, so yeah, that, that's what that looks like if you want to Go to the next slide. So here, here's a table um, from a peer review paper. All the experts who've in depth studied the Hungarian Prey Codex and its connection to the Shroud. This includes atheists, skeptics, agnostics. So, for example, you have T Dr. Thomas de Weslow. He's a non religious agnostic, he's basically Kevin, but he has a PhD in art history and he is about 95 to 100 percent convinced that the Sh Shroud of Turin must have existed and its images were used in the creation of these images. And he considers, so they list about nine out of 11 features of the Hungarian Prey Codex. And you can see Thomas bases his decision off of studying nine of the 11 features. On the other end, we have the Shroud skeptic, Andrea Nicolotti, another PhD historian, um, and he's hard hardcore skeptic. Uh, it's, it's gotten blurry on my end, but as you can see, I think he's 95 to 100 percent convinced that the that the shroud was not used in creating these images. And he considers about 10 out of the 11 features. And as you go through the list, you, you can look at the other scholars and how many features did they look at and what degree of confidence do they have? Uh, uh, is that clear for the audience or is it blurry just for me? I it. It should be clear for the audience if it isn't like it might have to do with everybody's individual internet connection. I'm not sure. Um, but I've got a question uh, for you. What, what are they yep. saying yes and no to? So like, um, 
you know, Wilson in 2010 so, so said first, yes to poker holes. Oh, what, so what did Yel, what did Wilson in 2010 say yes about poker holes, like with reference to? Yeah, so he, uh, so it's yes, he considered this aspect. And uh, I think it's also he was saying yes, he thinks that the shroud was used to explain this feature. And is just a question for you. Are they talking specifically about this image here or just like the entire Hungarian trade codex or? No, just this, just, the, just this image, this image so here. He's saying, yes, he thinks that po poker, like do poker holes show up in this image? Yes. That's what he's saying. Okay. Uh, sorry. So, so yeah, go back down. So I was wrong. It, it's when they're saying yes, it specifically says that they considered this aspect. So when Wilson did his study, yes, he considered the poker holes as a factor in coming to his decision. Okay. That's so, all that's saying with yes. So the more yeses that somebody has here, the more closely they looked at the picture, I guess, or something like that. The more evidential factors they considered in coming to their conclusion, right? So you, you've got the one on the far left pool. Um, I, Again, it's a little fuzzy. I think he only considered one out of the 11 things. So you might not, okay, well, he didn't really look at everything and have a, a well-rounded opinion, right? He only looked at one factor and then he came to his decision. So you'd, you'd want to favor the scholars that actually looked at, you know, at least the majority, if not more of the features in coming to their decision, I guess. And this is almost arranged in a... Like from the left to the right, we're looking at scholars who considered more and more and more features. Like, I don't think it's organized that way, but uh, I, I, unless it is, I can't see it because it's blurry. But I, I think it's just going in chronological order of the scholars who've who've done an in depth study of it. It's not uh, chronological because yeah, it goes 2009, 2009, okay. 2015, 2010, 2015, 2009. Um, and I, so I, I could, have no idea then. I could count each individual yes, but I see all the way on the left, there's only one yes, and all the way on the right, there's only one no. Um, and it it looks like roughly it's increased. It's it like you know more factors. I could be wrong. It, okay. I guess that part doesn't really matter a whole lot. Um, and so, but the, the yeah, you may you may be right. I, I just can't see. And I and the point is that I guess um, we should be. Oh, actually, the second to lowest row says total, and then 1 out of 11, 3 out of 11, 4 out of 11, 5 out of 11, 5 out of 11, 6 out of 11. So it, it is going yeah. by order of increasing the number of um, uh, factors, features. yeah, features included in mm -hmm. the in the look. Um, and cool. so we should, I guess we should... Um, put more credence in the scholars who considered more features, I suppose. I definitely think so. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're going to come to kind of my own quick assessment. Uh, okay. We go to the next slide. If I think that's what's next. Um, okay. So I'm just giving you a close up of each of the images. Uh, so this is the upper panel known as the anointing scene in Byzantine art. Um, so I'll, I'll, I've listed these out, but I'll just do it by memory. But so, First feature that's similar to the shroud images. Okay, you have the right hand crossed over the left one, covering the groin. Okay, uh, that's just like the shroud. Also, no thumbs are visible on the shroud man, and he has four elongated fingers. Um, another feature here is that uh, on the pro shroud side, um, I don't know if you can see it because it's really blurry. I can't see it, but the, on the top, on the forehead of the man. There's a blood, look, looks like a, a blood stain. It corresponds to the Shroud Man's epsilon or reverse three shaped blood wound on the Shroud Man's forehead. So that's another feature on the pro Shroud side. Um, Finally, uh, can you guys see that, uh, Kevin? Uh, or? So I can't. I'm going to have the clearest picture out of anybody, probably. Um, and I don't know if I see. Are you talking about on on Jesus's head? There should be like a a, a blood stain somewhere above his right eye. There's like a little uh, red smudge type deal. If you if you yeah right it, here ish. Uh, what I would say, I guess, look it up on online and like really zoom in. You can see it kind okay. of thing, right? 
the other the final pro shroud factor here the one the only one that i find convincing really convincing for this upper panel is the fact that the body is totally nude it's totally naked and that is rare that that is never seen in byzantine art uh in this period it's not until a few hundred, hundreds of years later a couple hundred years later that we start getting new jesus scenes in this particular scene so shroud skeptics will say well we do get new jesus's in portrayed in his baptism for example or we do get one or two saints who are portrayed naked granted but you never see a naked jesus in terms of the post-resurrection anointing scene um that would have been considered sacrilege in byzantine art at this time so that's a, a factor why pro shroud guys say they must the only reason they did it is they're copying an authoritative source what would that have been the shroud of turin um now on the shroud skeptical and if you want to go to the next slide uh, there's a lack of a beard right so here i've got two factors jesus ha doesn't have a long beard despite this artist uh depicting long beards on the other figures okay um and also uh another shroud skeptical feature that i don't think works um is that well there's no wounds or scourge wounds depicted on the the jesus in this upper panel at all so i've color coded this red means i think it's a failure as an argument yellow means i'm kind of agnostic i i it's it doesn't convince me but I'm not, I don't disbelieve it either. And then the green means I think it probably suggests something in isolation. So the total nudity thing, I think, works as a factor on the pro shroud side. But the issue of the short beard um, or the scruffy type beard works on the shroud skeptical end. And I, I in my show, I'm famous as saying, I, based on the upper panel alone, I, I don't think we can prove a connection between the pre codex and the shroud of Turin. Um, all right, so then we have the lower panel, and this is the most interesting one on can the next slide. I, can I ask you a quick question about why you put the number one as red? Is it because it would be extremely weird to actually find, like, Jesus um, not having his genital area covered? Is that why? Oh, uh, yeah. So so I I don't think that this proves a connection to the shroud because number one, of course, they would want to cover, especially if they're depicting him nude, they would want to pr protect his manhood, right? Yeah. Even in the baptism scenes, they usually obscure it, but with water or yeah. something like that. Um, secondly, it's also in terms of the thumb. The thumbs is the most impressive. No thumbs and four long fingers. Yeah, but that's, that's just Byzantine art. I mean, okay. that, that is portrayed, even in this, if you go back up, even in this very same painting, look at the guy pouring oil. Oh, oh he's got yeah. four fingers, <laughs> no thumb. So this is just a Byzantine feature. This doesn't okay. prove, oh, he's, he's getting this from the shroud. Okay. Uh, that so that's sense. why it's a failure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. Sorry, I didn't mean to distract you. I just, I wanted to get inside your head for a second, so. Yeah, no worries, no worries. So here's the bottom one. This is the most interesting. This is where the most debate happens, right? So, um, yeah, if you, uh, okay, go, yeah, maybe go down to the table. I'm debating, should I have the image up or should I go to the table uh, as to what's, okay. So the first pro shroud argument here is, uh, again, I, I don't think it works, but they'll say, well, the dimensions fit. It's like a very long shroud cloth. Um, there's no, uh, so if you go back, uh, go back up there for the a second. Picture. Yep. So you can see there's no 3D lid, right? So if you look up at the top from the upper panel there, there is an edge representing the tomb lid that Jesus is resting on. Do you see that at the top of that picture that you're looking at? Oh, up, that's up here? Yeah. See, there's an edge, right? Like there's a, there's three dimensionality trying to be depicted for that tomb lid. There's, there's, this is a two dimensional uh, thing, right? There's no edge. If this is supposed to be a tomb lid, as the shroud skeptics say, why is there no three dimensional edge? So that's the, the first argument I would say. Um, again, I'm iffy on it. I don't think that that works. The, the second argument from memory, I guess we'll keep the image up, is um, there is a depiction of the blood belt which is unique to the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin, there's this unique blood stain across the small of the back. It looks like it, 
blood flowed from the chest wound, went around the back and then horizontally across the small of the back. That is supposedly depicted by these two red wiggly lines. Um, I don't know if Kevin can maybe circle it or, or highlight it or something. These wiggly this, lines would be somewhere where my mouse is, like it would be somewhere over here? Uh, well, okay, so go, go, uh, stop bouncing, go to the left. Go to uh, more to the left. Okay, to, to the right a bit. Like this red thing right here? No, uh, yeah, go down. Oh, down. Right, right here? That is the blood belt, according to the Pro Shroud side. That's what that is supposedly representing. And this is a unique feature to the Shroud of Turin. Uh, so that's that feature, right? This is supposedly the blood belt. Otherwise, what is that? If this is a tomb lid, why are there red squiggly lines that have no correspondence to anything? Uh, what are those doing there? Uh, so that's the next argument. Um, the other one, uh, another one is, okay, this one fails in my opinion, but the, the red crosses, these represent the scourge wounds or blood stains on the inside of the cloth. Um, I will say this, it, it, this argument is plausible. I, I, I don't think it works. I don't believe it, but it, it is plausible. And I found a picture of uh, Jesus with scourge wounds that are in the shape of red crosses. And that's in, in one of my upcoming slides. Maybe Do you want to jump ahead? There it is. There, there's the, if you, if you were able to zoom in, these wounds are in the shape of red crosses. So it, it's at least plausible. I don't think the pro shroud can prove their case, but it's not totally ridiculous to say, well, maybe this artist depicted these red crosses uh, to symbolize the blood stains. Why did you do that? I don't know. But uh, um, anyways, um, oh, why do I have that green? Okay, that's weird. Um, okay, the other one is the herringbone weave of the cloth. Um, so yeah, if you go back to the image, um, there are these stair patterns. And this is said by the pro shroud side to represent the herringbone weave, which is unique to the shroud of the cloth. On the shroud skeptic side, they say, no, this is just representing oinks marble of a tomb or something like that. Now, against the pro shroud side is that, well, look, a stair-like pattern, these like step stair type patterns, this is not what herringbone weave looks like. So obviously this artist is not trying to draw that. But Bob Rucker has actually proven from the shroud cloth with uh, photo micrographs that actually, yeah, if you took a look, a close up look at the shroud, you could, would see these stair-like patterns, step stair patterns. So this is actually consistent with observing the shroud textile and its herringbone weave. Um, at the very least, that's a plausible argument. Um, last, go ahead. To be clear, though, it the like this is not like the shroud looks like a shroud, right? It looks like a like a piece of of cloth, right? Like there's there's no visible staircase pattern. Um, when you just look at the shroud with your eyes, right? There is if you get close up to it. Um, but not, like, not like this, right? Not not like it's depicted. Like they would... Correct. Yeah. yeah, like if you're standing from like six feet back. But again, this is a, a painting and stuff, right? So it's... And this artist is clearly not the best artist that ever existed. <laughs> this, this is why there's trouble. Uh, so now the most convincing aspect... And I do have a picture of that somewhere on the following slides, but it's these L-shaped holes. Uh, uh, so there's the blood belt. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Let me go back to the blood belt. That, Yeah, right there. Okay. And then right here, the L-shaped poker holes. Yeah. This is by far the most convincing feature. Um, it, it's what really convinces me. But corresponding, there are these poker holes or in the shape of an L on the Shroud of Trin in the same relative location and that sort of thing. And it's found here on, on this depiction. It, now, even the Shroud Skeptic Q Fairy admits these holes serve no decorative or functional purpose. Uh, so there, there is no real plausible explanation on the Shroud Skeptic side. If this is a tomb lid, what are these? They just make no sense. Um, so that's why most pro Shroud guys say, well, this obviously he was copying the Shroud. There were these L-shaped holes. So he is representing these L-shaped holes. Um, so that, that's the pro shroud side. On the shroud skeptic side, uh, a very devastating critique um, that I think works is 
Hugh Ferry's prior probability argument. This is the argument that Kevin himself gives. And look, this scene is all the way through Byzantine art repeatedly, and it is the tomb in those scenes. And it looks remarkably similar in terms of the three Marys and the anointing of Jesus and that sort of thing. Um, so I have, I have to admit, yeah, just based on, I think that, look, if all you're considering is that evidential factor based on prior probability and other previous images of the same scene and how they match the shroud, am I still talking? You know, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, I, cool. Loud and clear. No, I click something. So it's like, um, that, that is a good argument on the Shroud skeptic side and causes me massive cognitive dissonance. I, I just have to be honest that, especially because we have that crumpled up thing in the middle that could be said to be the Shroud. Um, so yeah, if you go that, go right. back, that yeah. So the, the pro Shroud response, I don't buy this, but Bob Rucker has come up with a ingenious solution. He says, well, look in the middle, that's a knife. And this crumpled up mess is does look like it's attached. I went really close up. Does look like it's part of the cloth because there are two strips that look like they're part of it. Um, this thing see, right here is a knife. That's Bob Rucker's hypothesis. Okay. Right. And he says, look, what they did is they cut off part of the cloth. And if you go uh, go back to the main image. Uh, do you see Mary with the blue, dark blue halo? This one? Look at her arm. She's holding something up, and it looks like a face. So what Bob Rucker is saying is like, well, look, they cut off the facial image of the cloth, and they gave that to Mary to hold up. Maybe that, that's the, I don't know, Sudarium of Oviedo. That's Bob's explanation. Um, I personally don't, I don't believe this is, this is what it is. I think it's pareidolia. Um, especially if you look at the knife, it looks like it's actually part of the cloth because the knife tip bends, it bends in and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, I the only thing uh, I would say is that it does look like the this folded up cloth is a part of the tomb. There are these little X's uh, of the herringbone weave being preserved and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, they, like I said, this prior probability argument is a tricky one. This one heavily favors the Shroud skeptics and um, does cause me cognitive dissonance to the point where I'm I'm not sure. Do I believe this or not? Um, you know, sometimes I'm skeptical. Some it, it, It's very weak. I'm in the low 50s at most or in the 40s and stuff like that on um, the, the other end. So I think those are the... Did I cover all the factors? Is, yeah. Um, I guess I've got one quick question for you is... Um... You know the the herringbone pattern, so called uh, that step stair kind of thing, right there. It's not present on this uh, like swooshy part of the cloth over here. Um, but there yeah. are those X's. Like if you see, there's X's on the tomb lid. Yes, and then the X's on the cloth. Yeah, which is a bit. Uh, again, like I, I wish this guy was a better drawer. And stuff. <laughs> yeah, that would help. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I think I think you could, if you wanted, if you were gonna go with the pro short side, you could say no. This is this is all part of the same thing because why would he put X's on it if just out of nowhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So yeah, um, bo bottom line is in terms of the Hungarian pre codex. At best, it's very weak evidence. So, you know, I'm I'm happy to agree with with you that okay, this isn't good evidence, or this isn't the strongest evidence to support the pro shroud side in terms of disproving a medieval date. But the Hungarian pre codex is by not the only evidence we have. We have lots of other evidences that prove the shroud goes back centuries before the medieval period, uh, well before 1000 AD. You know, we have the Sidarium of Oviedo. We have Julio Fonte's uh, dating physical test, placing the shroud in the first century. We, we've got um, the statistical argument from coins. Um, we, we've got other arguments, essentially, and proofs that are much stronger than the Hungarian Prey Codex. Uh, so that's it on that. Okay, cool, cool. I'm happy with that. Um, do you want to move into the next section? That would be uh, sure. art. So that'll be pigment. And I guess, so we've kept everybody for two hours so far. 
do you think that we can Ooh, actually i've got a question for you it's been two hours i like to keep my streams at the most around two hours and 30 minutes so let me ask you do you think that we should do um the pigments and then also the proportions today or do you think that we should maybe uh try one of them and save the other one for another conversation or even save both of them for another conversation what are you thinking um yeah so i guess it's up, up to the audience as well but uh i'm, I'm happy doing either so if you want to set up a, a date and go over the two i think it would be best if we are going to split it up let's do the two artistic claims together um and keep that thing so uh, i think i think that makes a lot of sense and truthfully um most of the audience had to dip we're down to to four so hey you four who are watching now you guys are real ones but um <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, dedicated yeah yeah they are they are but um i maybe before we wrap up i can just ask you like a couple of um kind of like epistemological type questions we could maybe spend like 10 or so minutes on that and then we'll kind of wrap it up for today how does that sound sounds perfect yeah okay awesome so i guess my question for you is something like this um when I think about the shroud, I, I often kind of get um, maybe like frustrated with the fact that um, the church doesn't let more testing be done on it. Um, mm -hmm. What uh, that impacts the way that I think about the shroud, um, like the way that I think about the shroud is definitely um, like I would have a lot more confidence in it if the church had a lot more confidence in it. If that makes sense, the church doesn't seem to have much confidence in it. Um, and so that impacts how I think about it. Does that impact how you think about it? Um, and if it doesn't, I guess I'll ask like why it doesn't. And I, you know, it, it would be fair to ask me like, well, why does it impact your belief, Kevin? But I'm asking you right now. So what do you think? Um, so it, it, it doesn't impact me at all right because it, again uh, number one i've got insider information i know people that are actually submitting proposals and, and stuff like that and it's basically ever since the pope took over he's the one obstructing uh, oh there i am uh he's the one obstructing it right so the last test we have was when it was when king umberto was the owner and that's when we could actually have scientific testing done but the pope uh he's a politician he doesn't want to rock the boat and he basically, I, I think that for them, unreasonably so, the 1988 dating shocked them a bit and they don't want to rock the boat. They, they, they are afraid, but that doesn't impact me because that's a very human reaction. They're not basing it on rational evidence or, or they're not warranted basically in, they don't, they, it's not like they know something we don't um, as their reason for why they're not allowing testing. And again, I know the insider. I've seen the correspondences and the letters. The guys from Turin that actually keep the shroud desperately want more testing. They're doing everything behind the scenes to get that, that done. Um, but unfortunately, the, the king left the shroud to the pope. And this pope is is never going to submit something. We, we have, we're going to have to wait for the next pope. It will never happen under this guy. Just take my word for it. We, we've tried the answer will always be no from him. So hopefully the next Pope will do it. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't impact me because the Pope has no provable warrant as though he has like secret knowledge as to why they're not allowing testing. Everything's out there in the, in the scientific peer reviewed literature. Uh, in fact, I, we know more than the Pope does about it. Probably you and me, just because we've actually studied the peer reviewed papers. Um, you do, yeah. you, you, you do. I don't, I don't know about me, but you definitely do. Um, okay, <laughs> but but I, I you know something that I will say is um, I have to imagine that the Pope uh, and so like for I guess first of all it's not just Pope Francis right um, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth also didn't let it happen and Saint uh, Pope Saint John Paul II didn't let it happen right I mean who was Pope when they were allowing testing was actually that might have been hold on but the it, testing but the was Pope had, the Pope had no say because it was owned by the King of Italy right King oh Alberto. okay okay so. Um, so yeah. no pope has ever approved testing, be, and the popes also never owned it until after the radiocarbon uh, dating had been completed. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. 
Um, well, I, I, I happen to think that like the popes, you know, they're kind of like presidents in as much as they have like cabinets of people who advise them. And so I imagine that they have advisors and that these advisors are telling them the risk to reward ratio is just not worth it. As in the amount of money that uh, we would lose in pilgrimages. And that's the cynical side of me, but then also the less cynical side of me, the amount of faith that would be destroyed if this thing was proven false versus the amount of faith that would be generated if this thing was proven true. It's like the, it's just not worth it, is, is I think what the church's attitude kind of is. Do you, do you think that that's what the church's attitude is? I, th I think you're right. Like, again, based on what I've known and stuff like that. And again, you, you never know 100%. I, I can't read what's in his mind directly and stuff. I'm just inferring here. But I think what you said is right. There is that cost benefit analysis. But it just may, I don't understand why that makes an impact on you at all because it, it's almost like you have this well they've got they've got secret knowledge that we don't that they're basing their cost benefit analysis on no they they've got access it's all out there it, there's nothing hidden i mean we we've had experts into the secret vatican archives and stuff like that on the pro shred side there, there's nothing there's no like oh we've got this secret proof that the shrouds are fake but we don't want people to know about it no they're they're just afraid they got the 1988 results and they're kind of like, okay, this this kind of backfired. Let, let's just keep the status quo. Right. Um, a typical politician move. It has nothing to do with the evidence. Or, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I guess the reason why it does kind of impact like my belief about the Shroud is because I have to imagine that if they were confident that the Shroud really was the burial Shroud of Jesus, then they they would be submitting it for testing. Um because I can only imagine if I was Pope and I was confident that the Shroud was the burial. I mean, even if I wasn't confident, I would submit it for testing just to put this matter to bed. Now, that is me, and I'm not a politician, and I never will be a politician. Um, but uh, I just view the fact, like, I, I view it as a vote of no confidence, if that makes sense. Um, I, I, I think you're right that the pope right because it's just him everyone else wants to test it the guys in turin holding it they want to test it they're doing it but it's it's the pope he has no confidence in it but it, and the vatican advisors it too it's it's not like the pope is making this decision without talking to his people right like so i think that there's a circle of influential cardinals involved here too mm -hmm. but but that aside and like i have to imagine that like one of those circle of influential cardinals knows enough like he knows more about me he i mean he knows more than about the shroud than i do that's what i have to imagine is that um one of these advisors in the vatican one of these cardinals um knows more the, about the shroud than i do that's what i have to imagine i don't think so i think that uh, again i'm not speaking for you but i i think that members of the public know tons more than a lot of the cardinals because a lot I mean, look, we've got cardinals. You saw the shroud display without Cardinal Sean Seanborn. He knows we've we've reached out to him directly in community. That guy knows nothing about the shroud at okay. all. And if this is one of the guys disrespecting the shroud to the to the public, I mean, this is a guy who depicted the Last Supper as a as a homoerotic orgy. I have no. Uh, maybe this is just the Protestant in me, but I, the cardinals and the Pope opinion mean nothing to me unless you can provide if me your hands reason together to they know something we don't that's conclusive either way um do you know father andrew dalton uh this guy I do. Yeah. um he works in the vatican somewhere right like he's stationed in in the vatican he's uh, so Barry Schwartz, they, they both teach at the, there's a master's in the shroud of train at the pontifical academy and they both teach um for that right I, I think andrew dalton may head it up or, or okay maybe he's the leader there but i know barry schwartz is one of the professors for example he teaches a course on on that based on photography and and stuff he he was okay. on my show sharing his masters yeah barry schwartz wants more testing right absolutely he he is with it he's on the board of the guys in turin so he that he's kind of the one that gives me the insider knowledge as to the behind the scenes when we because we submit official proposals 
all the time. I mean, Bob Rucker worked on it. Mark Antinacci has done stuff. Like, we we always submit stuff, right? And they just never the only reason approved. where they never get approved. The Pope is just nope. Um, what once it goes to Rome, it's nope. Um, basically, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jeez. Yeah, and I guess yeah. I guess the way that it works for me is I just kind of figure that like. I guess like my empirical kind of brain just thinks like, Hey, Hey, look, like, you know, the, the evidence that we do have in form of the radiocarbon dating says medieval, we do have these just so stories that could explain away, like, you know, that could explain why the results were the way that they were like the invisible reweave hypothesis, like the, uh, the, 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 the neutron thing. Um, but like we could put those theories to bed, right? If we just did more testing, <laughs> and the people yeah. the people who own the shroud don't seem confident that they would get the answer that they would hope, and so it's kind of like, well, okay, the evidence that we do have points to medieval, and the people who would let us do more testing to confirm whether or not that's true aren't letting us do it. So, like my, I guess my situation is kind of like where I'm just like, well, okay, then if the best if the best that I have is this this paper from nature that was published in 1988 or whatever and then that's the best that i have you know and until until the vatican lets us do more i'm kind of like well you know we can we can uh we can imagine all these just so stories about invisible reweave hypotheses and all that but you know un until we do the empirical work it's just kind of it's just kind of that right it's just it's just another hypothesis and it's like well let's <laughs> let's test the gosh darn child <laughs> You know, well, I'll just I'll just ask you though, because look, we we have samples already removed from the shroud, and that that's why we get new results. Because, for example, as as you posted up, that we are still testing shroud samples mm -hmm. from the nineteen seventy eight and and sub for two thousand and two restoration project and that sort of thing. And we've done dating tests, right? We Julio Fonte has in peer reviewed journals published papers proving the shroud dates to the first century. On was that that X ray diffraction thing? Yep, there's X-ray dating. There was three other scientific tests, and that right? was a brand new. Like he validated that method on the sh like for the shroud, right? Well, yeah, but he used controls that all worked and got the correct dates, right? And AMS carbon dating was new. It was only ten years old when it was used to date the shroud. So sure. I don't think we're I'm skeptical about that paper with uh, the X-ray diffraction because he developed that method specifically for the shroud. Like if there's a method that's developed for the shroud, I'm like, well, why, why don't we just use like, like there's assays out there that are developed, right? Like we're not reinventing the wheel when we like, like, we, like why do we need a special assay just to like, why can't we use the same methods to test the shroud that we do to test everything else? You know what I mean? Like it just well, kind of, it's because they're we're not allowed to do those and they're destructive tests, right? So we have to in, invent non-invasive or non-destructive dating tests, and that we requires. Have, we have those. We have non-destructive dating methods that are like already established. Um, I'm sure that there's even X-ray ones that work on fiber, right? I'm I'm sure. Um, and the reason I make a big deal about this is because, uh, like, I work in in like medicine, like in in pharma, and. Mm -hmm. um, like, can you imagine if like a pharma company was like, hey, everybody, we just came out with this new drug and we developed this brand new test and we're only going to use it on this drug. And this test gives us exactly the results that we want. Wow. This is a wonder drug. Everyone would Sounds be like, like COVID vaccines. <laughs> hey, I, I would okay. do a whole stream with you on those because I, I'm a big, uh, I've seen all the, the phase one safety data and I'm, I'm, a, you know, anyway, that's a whole other topic. Um, cool. yeah. but, but yeah, I guess, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I guess my whole point was that, um, like whenever I see a, a method being developed for a paper for, a, I'm like, why are you re reinventing the wheel? This is a little weird. Uh, see, I, I guess with science that that doesn't make any sense. We, we should always be looking for new and improved. Uh, again, the AMS carbon 14 dating was not established. This was a new technique to improve and, to make it better than the original carbon dating and, and stuff like that. So I, I think we should always be looking for new techniques and our, our issue should be, does this work or not? And that's why there are proper controls and scientific protocols. Another thing is 
it isn't just the x-ray dating. Julie Fonte has employed a total of four different uh, scientific physical tests, is, you know, FTIR, um, Raymond spectroscopy dating, and um, uh, mechanical strength test. All four of these just happen to align with the first century. So unless you, unless you're going to attribute fraud, that seems weird to me. Why would they all, if they don't work, why would they all erroneously arrive at the first century? Um, how, how, how are you going to date from an FTIR? Um, I don't, I, I published the paper. I have a show with Julio Fonte where he describes exactly what he, what he did, but, um, it's, it's, yeah, again, it's based on the, all of these tests are based on the wear and tear of the, of the fabric over time and that sort of thing. There, there was also a microchemical test, which I don't think works, but that was done by Ray Rogers and he compared it to the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's based on the wear and tear basically of the textile over time. Okay. So I used to do FTIR. Well, I didn't run the test myself, but I, I used to be like a, um, a, I used to be a project manager in a, uh, in a facility that micronized API active pharmaceutical ingredient. Um, mm -hmm. and when, whenever you micronize a drug, you, you have to worry about changing like the actual way that the, like the chemical composition and you can check that through FTIR. So like we would do FTIR, like we would take like a tiny little sample of, of the drug prior to micronization and we would take a sample after micronization and we would compare them and hope that they match up. And if they didn't match up, uh oh, something changed. Like just the, the chemical composition is different. That's the only way that I know, like that's the only application that I know for FTIR. Um, so I'm not yeah. sure how we could use that for dating, but I'd love to read more about it. Yeah, let's let's. I will send you these things, and let's let's follow up briefly. Like, if you're gonna invite me back, I, I might not get invited back. Since never, too long. never. <laughs> okay. uh, but yeah, let, let's follow up. I I want to hear. Okay, once you look into these things, okay, now what is your opinion? What do you make and stuff like that? Did did yeah. it convince you? Not? So yeah, I'll send you the papers and the links to the shows and stuff. That'd be awesome. Um. So okay, next time. I'm going, oh, we should tell the audience, I suppose. I'll be going on your show for a completely different topic in a week and a half or whatever. Um, but then how about after that? We plan like another couple of weeks after that. We have you back on here to finish this conversation. That'll give me time to actually look at the um, like the FTIR and the um, X-ray diffraction and stuff. Um, and then we could also, if we want to talk about the art stuff too, I think we should talk about the art stuff too. Yeah, that'll be the majority of the of the show. But I, I just want I would like to get a follow up like, OK, you know what you're talking about. You're a scientist. I, I'm not. I'm just taking what Fonte and, and these guys do. Um, but yeah, so I'd love to see. Did it convince you or not when you actually read the, the papers and see what they did? Cool. And also, don't let me fool you. I'm not like an actual chemist. I'm a chemical engineer. So like I'm a lot cruder than like actual chemists. You know what I mean? So don't let me fool you with my big science words. I don't actually like, you know, it's, it's not my, um, you know, expertise. Yeah. It's not my expertise. It's just stuff that I'm familiar with because I've worked in the industry and stuff like that. So, um, that's cool. Fonte is an engineer on his end technically as well. Right. So, so we're even that, perfect. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> awesome. No, yeah, I, I love this, man. It, this was, this was awesome. I know it got a little long, but I hope, there was some good info um, info on there for people to learn some of the arguments. Yeah. Hey, Dale, this was a blast. This was super cool. I love how in-depth we got. Um, my final question is always, um, where can we find you? And what are you working on next that excites you? Um, but feel free to also kind of just add in any, like uh, if you want to add, I guess, interim closing thoughts in there too. Uh, now is the perfect time for that. So, so where can we find you? What you working on? And any closing thoughts? Yeah, so I, I'm uh, on Real Seekers on YouTube, um, or my blog is realseekerministries.wordpress.com, which is where I'll post up a blog to this show along with the papers that I, I mentioned in the show. So you can go beyond just believing my words. You can research for yourself, um, you know, from the experts and stuff what I'm saying and get familiar with the methodologies and, and find out the truth for yourself. 
um, that's always my measure of success. I, I look at who's clicking on the actual links and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, next up, my next show is going to be on Easter Sunday, believe it or not, mm-hmm. with uh, another unbelieving skeptic, uh, David Kemble C- Cook, who was supposed to be on my show last week, but uh, he had a time zone change in the UK, so it messed everything up. Uh, so he'll he'll be coming on Easter Sunday to discuss the evidence for the empty tomb. Uh, can we prove Ooh. there was an empty tomb? I say yes. He says nay. Sounds exciting. So every, af, after you all attend a traditional Latin high mass audience, go watch Dale's show because obviously we're all good traditionalist Catholics here. Dale included. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I don't uh, think. Me I'm neither. Hardcore Baptists. <laughs> same, same difference. Same difference. Dale, this was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, links will be in the description down below as soon as we are off the phone here. And everybody, until next time.